we start with the idea of a category, which is already a fairly interesting kind of way of abstractly representing all sorts of structures and patterns. And then we look at how to define things in terms of category theory in more and more sort of general ways until we get to some really general ideas like universal morphisms and adjoint functors. And then when we get to that kind of level, we start to see that we have this sort of universal language which can describe all sorts of interesting things in mathematics. Now, the thing is with can extensions, in a sense, they kind of represent the limit of this sort of abstraction. It's a concept which is so general and so sort of abstract that pretty much all of the other ideas in category theory can be expressed in terms of can extensions. Now, personally, I really like can extensions so much because you can really do computations with them. Okay, you can really roll up your sleeves and work out can extensions. And it sort of becomes this tool that you can turn to all sorts of different issues. And, and rather than just sort of getting some mundane solution to some mathematical puzzle, a can extension can usually give you a whole other functor which has really different behavior and teaches you all sorts about the nature of this kind of universe of categories. And there's just so many places where you can apply the kind of tools I'm going to discuss today about how to compute can extensions. And you can work out can extensions or adjoint functors, and they're going to show you like radically different ways of looking at systems which you already deal with. So can extensions are amazing. And to introduce them, I want to sort of try to illustrate this idea of abstraction. So here's a pretty simple thing that's going on in ordinary mathematics. It's the Cartesian product of these two sets here. Okay. So what we have going on here, we have this set X, which has elements A, B, and C. We have this set Y, and we've constructed the Cartesian product of X and Y, this set of all pairs of an element of X with an element of Y. And so it's interesting to think about the different levels that you can think about this kind of mathematical object on. You could literally just see it sort of as itself, as this collection of pairs. And then at a bit of a higher level of abstraction, you can say, well, okay, this is an instance of a Cartesian product of two sets. And then if you want to view this a little bit more generally, you could say, well, X and Y are objects in this category set, and this is the categorical product of them. And then if you want to look at things more generally still, you can then say, well, okay, a product is an instance of a limit. And then if you want to go more general still, you could then say, well, um, the limit is a case of a right adjoint. It's the right adjoint of a diagonal functor. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, I'll get on to these ideas later. And then you can go even further and you could say, well, this is actually a case of basically a can extension. And so it turns out then that we've sort of zoomed out enough that we can get to can extensions. And you can do this in so many places in mathematics. I mean, it's amazing how many different, what well, really different looking ideas can be expressed in terms of can extensions. For example, we're going to see that the connectivity of graphs, the way that graphs are, sort of fall into these different connected components, that can be expressed in terms of can extensions. The idea of for all and uh, there exists in logic, 
they're deeply related to can extensions. The all sorts of ideas that you would have thought were completely different. For example, if we have a set of elements, let's say zero and one, well, we can form a dynamical system which has states as infinite sequences of zeros and ones and updating a state corresponds to doing the left shift on it. So this sort of dynamical system, which is closely related to all sorts of interesting kinds of chaotic dynamics that are observed in different places. This can also be viewed in terms of can extensions. There's just so many places in mathematics where they occur. And so it's so worthwhile to learn them. Now, this is, I must say, I want to be honest, it's, it's a, um, a rather abstract and in some sense kind of complicated um, notion is the notion of can extensions. Maybe the actual definition is not that hard to absorb, but um, actually computing can extensions can, you know, be quite challenging. But I think it's so worthwhile to do this. Like, I think there's a difference in the value of, this is my own sort of biased opinion, but I think there's a difference in the sort of value of different mathematical ideas. There are certain ideas from maths which are really very much just sort of one-off computational tools. For example, you know, how to do some kind of a trick to perform a certain integration. That's the kind of thing that, you know, if you're encountering particular integrals, often it's useful to know. But then if you never do any integration for uh, a couple of years, you know, if you went on holiday or something, um, then, you know, that probably would just disappear from most people's minds because it's not the kind of thing you think about all the time. But I think there's a big difference between ideas like that and ideas like adjoint functors or can extensions, because these are really, in my opinion, sort of like universal organizing kind of principles. And if you're aware of them, you'll see them everywhere in the world. Um, and they change your viewpoints on all sorts of different things. And they're sort of so beautiful and powerful that it's kind of hard to forget them once you know. And so, yes, these ideas are pretty abstract and, you know, they are challenging to learn, but I think it's just so worthwhile to do this because it gives you this kind of infinite toolbox for figuring out all sorts of other things that are going on in mathematics. And in, a, in my opinion, it kind of gets close to this sort of holy grail of mathematics, which is really understanding the kind of underlying reasons why disparate areas of mathematics look similar and what sorts of mechanisms are going on behind that. And also, they're just great fun, okay? Um, when you do um, understand how to do computations with them, you're going to be moving around on so many different levels conceptually um, that it's just, it's extremely uh, exciting. So, you know, that being said, let's get into this. Okay, so what I want to start with is a fairly specific example, which has to do with finding the connected components of a graph. So I'm basically going to start with this example and then kind of keep zooming out until we get to the kind of full idea of can extensions, because as I say, it is a rather abstract kind of concept. And I believe a good way to shed light on such things is by starting with specific cases, kind of gradually increasing the level of generality. So we're going to start with the idea of the category of graphs. Now, um, it's sort of unavoidable that 
this uh, video is going to have quite some prerequisites. Um, so there's basically certain videos that I've done before, which I think, you know, you ought to watch or at least be aware of the ideas within in order to understand this video. I don't normally like having videos with lots of prerequisites, but in this case, I think this video would be about four hours longer if I explained every kind of piece of category theory machinery that we're going to use. So um, I'll instead just sort of point you in the directions of the appropriate videos so you can read upon the background in order to understand what's going on. So the first idea is this idea of what one might call a category of structured sets. I like to write these categories of structured sets as set to the power of C. And that means that the objects of these kind of functor categories like this, like set to the power of C, the objects are going to be functors from this category C to set. And the arrows are going to be natural transformations between such functors. So in this video, category theory for beginners, graphs and dynamical systems, I talk about how the category of graphs and the category of dynamical systems can be represented in this kind of form. Now, of course, more generally, we can have more general functor categories. So we don't have to have set here. We could have some general category D. And then when we write D to the power of C, we're talking about this category, which has objects as functors, um, X from C to D. And the arrows would be natural transformations between such functors. And um, of course, we compose these arrows in the way you'd imagine. Uh, which is basically just like vertical composition. So we just sort of compose these natural transformations component-wise. Anyway, at the moment, we're more interested in these kind of categories of structured sets where our category D here that we're having functors going into is set. Now, um, if you want to see why things like graphs and dynamical systems um, can be modeled um, using these kind of categories of structured sets, then you can look at this video. But I'm just going to give a sort of one minute recap of why that's the case. So if we consider this kind of category here, where C is actually this category here with two parallel arrows, S and T from an object E to an object V. Well, if we then think about what the form of set to the power of C is in that case, it's going to be this category of graphs. And to see why that's the case, let's think about a particular graph. So here I've drawn a particular graph X and you can see here how it can be represented as a functor from this category C into set. So in particular, if we send E to the edge set of our graph and we send V to the vertex set of our graph and we send this arrow S to this function here, which maps an edge to its source. And we send this arrow T to this function here, which maps an edge to its target then we can represent this data of this graph as in what the vertex set is, what the edge set is, and what the sources and targets of the different edges are. So with this, we can see that um, a graph can basically be viewed as a functor from this category C here, which I often like to abbreviate by this little pictogram here. Uh, basically showing two parallel arrows. So we can view a graph as a functor from this category of two parallel arrows into set. And then it turns out that the natural transformations between such functors give a very sort of natural, 
idea of arrows between graphs. And so then we can think that we actually have a category of graphs and these kind of functors correspond to the objects. And then the kind of natural transformations between those functors correspond to our kind of arrows between graphs. And that's why we can very succinctly write sets to the power of this category of two parallel arrows. And when we write this, we're talking about this functor category, uh, the category of functors from this two parallel arrow category to set. And this is a very nice sort of succinct piece of notation, which means the category of graphs. OK, so a great question to often ask in category theory is, is there a natural kind of arrow from one object to another? And I mean natural in the everyday sense of the word. So, for example, we have this category of graphs and this category set. And these are both categories. So they're both objects in this category of categories. And so is there a kind of natural arrow from graphs to sets? In other words, is there a sort of natural way to associate every graph with a set? And asking questions like that can be very profitable because often the sorts of arrows, or in this case, functors, which suggest themselves are going to be of some kind of fundamental importance mathematically. And so as a challenge to you, can you think of a functor from this category of graphs to this category of sets, which is going to reveal some kind of information about the connectivity of graphs? So if you want to pause the video and think about that now, feel free. So, OK, in particular, then there's going to be a functor which sends a graph to its weakly connected components. So I better define what I mean by a weakly connected component. So if we have a graph, let's say, for example, this graph Y. Well, if it's possible to go from one vertex to another vertex by repeatedly traversing edges where we can traverse an edge in either direction, then we say that those two vertices are weakly path connected. So for example, we'd say that vertex D and vertex F here are weakly path connected because you'd have to go along some of the edges the wrong way, but if you just use the edges as kind of undirected links, then you can get from vertex D to vertex F in two hops. OK, so what I'm saying is that if you imagine the directed graph as undirected and it's possible to walk from one vertex to another, then we say those two vertices are weakly path connected. Now, the vertices of the graph naturally get partitioned up into these different weakly connected components where we say that two vertices are within the same weakly connected components if and only if they're weakly path connected. OK, so this is really a very simple idea visually. For example, in this graph X, we have this weakly connected component with vertices A and B and this weakly connected component with vertex C. So these are just really the two sort of isolated pieces of the graph. And then this uh, graph Y just has a single weakly connected component because ignoring the directed, because ignoring the directions of the edges, it will be possible to walk from any vertex to any other vertex. So what we want to do then is have a functor which sort of represents the weakly connected components of a graph. And we're going to call this functor sigma for reasons that will hopefully become clear later. And it just maps a graph to its set of connected components. So this graph X here has these two connected components and therefore is mapped to a two element set. And so we could call this set sigma of X. And this graph Y just has one connected component 
So we could call this graph sigma of y. Now, do we really have a functor here? Well, in order to be a functor, we don't just have to talk about what happens on objects. We also have to talk about what happens with arrows. So what about if we have an arrow in this category of graphs? Let's say we have an arrow from y to x, for example. So can we cook up a morphism from this graph y to this graph x? Well, remember that a morphism or an arrow in this category of graphs is a way to send the vertices and edges of the first graph to the vertices and edges of the second graph in such a way that for every edge, the image of the target is the target of the image and the source of the image is the image of the source. Okay. So in particular, in this case, we could just send all of these vertices to vertex C and all of these edges to number three here. And this is going to give us this arrow alpha, which is an arrow from Y to X. Or if you like, we could think of alpha as a natural transformation from this functor Y to this functor X. But anyway, um, is there going to be a natural sort of way to convert this arrow between graphs into an arrow between sets that respects this kind of connectivity thing? Well, yes, because um, when we do a arrow between graphs, when we do a sort of graph morphism, we're always going to be sending things in a particular connected component to the same connected component, okay? So in particular, in this case, we're sending all of the stuff in Y to this kind of connected component on the right in X. And so the kind of image of this under our functor sigma is going to be sending this single connected component of Y to this sort of right side connected component of X. So this is going to give us the lifting of this arrow alpha under sigma. So I know I'm just sketching how this functor sigma works, but hopefully you get the idea. Basically it sends a graph to its set of weakly connected components and it changes a arrow between graphs to the sort of function between connected components, which tells you basically how the pieces of the original graph are sent to different connected components under our arrow alpha from a graph Y to a graph X. So I know I'm not being particularly concrete about how this functor works, and that's because we're actually going to see exactly how this functor's defined precisely later, because we're actually going to get this functor by using can extensions. So, I mean, hopefully you think that this kind of functor is interesting. I think it's very interesting. I think that the way that graphs are connected together has a lot to do with a really big variety of things in mathematics. And that it's very interesting that there's this single kind of functor, which tells us about how graphs are connected together. And also bear in mind that graphs are just one kind of structured set. And there's all sorts of other kinds of structured sets which have sort of different notions of connectivity. For example, dynamical systems and functions and simplicial sets. And that basically what we're going to do uh, amongst many other things is we're going to get this sort of functor which gives us our connectivity. And we're going to get it by thinking about can extensions. And so it's quite magical how these things just sort of fall out of this theory. And in particular, um, we're basically going to get this functor sigma as the sort of left adjoint to another functor of interest. 
And so that other functor of interest goes in the other direction. It's a functor from set to our category of graphs. And so again, I ask you, can you think of a functor like that? Can you think of a functor which sends a set to a graph? And I'll give you a hint. You want a sort of functor which sends a set to a graph which is like the original set that you started with. Okay, so here's the kind of functor we're talking about. It sends a set, for example, this set A, to the kind of discrete graph with vertex set A. So this is the graph which basically has a self loop or a point for every element of the set capital A. Okay, so there's actually a even sort of clearer way to think about how this functor works. We could essentially call it the diagonal functor. Okay, so it basically sends a set to a graph which has that set as its vertex set and that set as its edge set and the source and the target functions for that graph are just identity functions. Okay, so every edge has the same name as its source and its target and the set of vertices is the same as the original set that we operated on. So this makes a lot of sense if you want to change a set into a graph, okay? Um, so in particular, one way you can sort of measure a set in the category of sets is to think about this terminal object, which we often call one, and uh, that's just a single element set. And then we can measure how many points there are in another object of set. So in general, in a category, a point of an object, for example, a point of this object B, is an arrow into B from the terminal object. So there are two points of this object B here. This one I've drawn here, and also this one here. And so notice that in set, the different points of an object, there would be the arrows or functions into that object from the terminal object, the single element set. Those points of that object correspond with the elements of that set. Now it's a bit different for graphs, at least in general. So for graphs, so a terminal object in the category of graphs is this graph which has a single self loop. And so a point of a graph is an arrow from this single self loop into that graph. And so a point of a graph corresponds to a single self looping edge within that graph. So this graph delta B, for example, so this graph delta B, for example, has two points one point for this self loop at C and one point for this self loop at D. And so now you can hopefully see that. And so now you can hopefully see one of the nice features of this functor is that it sort of preserves the number of points in an object it operates on. If it operates on a object B, which has two points in set, as in two arrows into it from the terminal object, then it sends that um, object B in set to this object delta B, which is the graph, which just has two points. And they're separate points, just like they were in set. So we call this functor the diagonal functor. Now, um, this is how we can kind of think of it directly. It's pretty straightforward to imagine just getting a set and then just kind of um, forming this set of self loops. And it's interesting actually that this is possible because if you think about it, this means that we can actually think of everything that's going on in set as a sort of full subcategory of what's going on in this category of graphs because 
um, there's always these kind of graphs which are just full of these trivial loops and they act just like sets and we can do functions on them and do all the shenanigans that we can do in the category set. So, okay, let's be a bit more precise about how this diagonal functor works then. So it's going to send a set A, an object of set, to this kind of functor delta A from this category with two parallel arrows to set. And the way that this functor delta A works is it basically sends everything in this category to the set A. In particular, it sends all the objects in this category to A, and it sends all the arrows in this category to the identity arrow of A. So that's basically how it works. Um, and then also, if we have um, a function F from a set A to a set B, well, A is going to get sent to this constant functor delta A and B is going to get sent to this constant functor delta B and F is going to get mapped to this natural transformation delta F. Now that's going to have two components, delta F of V and delta F of E. And both of those two different components are both going to just be this function F from set A to set B. All right, so essentially the only thing that this kind of diagonal or discrete functor does is it changes a set to the kind of graph which is just built out of a load of loops, one loop for every element. And it changes a function to the kind of corresponding kind of graph map, but working on the loops. Now, the reason I mention all of this stuff is that there's a remarkable connection between this kind of diagonal functor and this weakly connected component functor, sigma, that I mentioned before. And that's depicted by this picture here, which is trying to show that sigma here is actually the left adjoint to this diagonal functor delta. And what this picture is trying to show is that this sigma here is actually the left adjoint to this diagonal functor delta here. And this is a really remarkable thing because what it's essentially telling us is that if we have any one of these two functors, we can recover the other one by using kind of category theory constructions. And it's even more remarkable than that because with the kind of tools we're going to talk about today, we can really do these kind of problems in an almost automatic kind of way. We can like go from one of these kind of functors to another one. Now, if this all seems too specific to you, if it just seems like, oh, it's to do with connectivity of directed graphs, that's something I already know about. Believe me, I'm, I'm really just um, illustrating this as a very, very, very special case of something much more general. Okay, so in particular, we don't have to be dealing with categories of graphs. There's a, the same kind of thing happens for any kind of categories of structured sets. And there's more other kinds of things going on besides. Um, so let me just stick with graphs momentarily um, because I think graphs are a nice kind of simple place where we can get a handle on the kind of basic stuff that's going on and then we're going to sort of start to step up in levels of generalization. Okay so in this video I'm going to be talking about adjoint functors a lot and to be honest there's so much there that I think um, if you're not aware of adjoint functors, then you probably want to check out this video, Category Theory for Beginners Adjoint Functors, um, because there's a lot of different ideas which we're going to be using. Um, um, however, I do just want to show you 
um, a very quick kind of hack for finding our joint functors. Um, so there's many different ways to approach them and there's various different ways one can go about trying to find our joint functors. But I mean, basically the thing with our joint functors is that if you know one of them and you know it has, let's say, a left adjoint, then you ought to be able to construct that. And I'll show you a, a rough kind of way to do it, which is often very useful in practical situations. So consider our situation, for example, I'm claiming that this functor sigma to do with weakly connected components is the left adjoint to this diagonal functor delta. So then how can we sort of understand the nature of that kind of uh, adjunction? Well, one thing I always like to do to start with is to draw the situation out in a sort of diagram like this. So this is just a personal thing really, but it helps me to organize my thinking. So the left adjoint points to the left and the right adjoint functor points to the right. So the next thing I often like to do is to use this kind of relationship, which we know exists between sigma and delta, um, if they're really adjoint to one another. So what this says is that the set of arrows uh, from the connected components of graph X to A in set is naturally isomorphic to the set of arrows in this category of graphs from a graph X to the sort of diagonalization or discretization of this set A. So basically what this is telling us is that there ought to be this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence, which is actually natural in both X and A, but um, for now, the important thing is there ought to be this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between arrows like this or functions like this in set and arrows like this in the category of graphs for any graph X and for any set A. And um, this might sound kind of cryptic, but it's remarkable in practical situations if you actually just draw out a few examples you can quite quickly see usually like what the nature of this kind of um, correspondence is. So if we can find out how we should send an arrow like this to an arrow like this or vice versa, um, according to how this kind of natural isomorphism works, which is basically defining our adjoint functors, if we can understand that, then if we know the nature of these kind of bijections between these two different sets, we can use that information to work out anything else about the adjoint functors. So it turns out that there are several different kind of um, bits of machinery at work with adjoint functors, but um, you can express how they work in terms of other ones. So there's basically four important things to do with our joint functors. There's um, this kind of isomorphism going this way. Uh, there's its inverse, which you know you can usually guess at if you can guess the how the original um, how the isomorphism works one way. You can guess how to invert it, and then the other things are called the unit and the co-unit. But you can get at those if you understand the nature of this kind of isomorphism between HOM sets. So this is a great place to kind of start. So let's just do a practical example then. We'll pick a set A. So on the left here, we have our category of sets and we've picked this set A here. And then on the right, we've got this category of graphs and we've picked a graph X. So then our functor delta is going to send this set A to this kind of discrete graph made of loops. And also our functor sigma is going to send this graph 
X here to its sort of set of weakly connected components. So in particular, let's sort of think of this graph as having these two different connected components, M and N. And so Sigma sends X to this set of M and N, which are like elements of a set representing these connected components that X has. So then the kind of question that we should ask ourselves is, if we have an arrow from Sigma X to A, is there a sort of natural way to put that in correspondence with an arrow from X to Delta of A? So if we look at this, uh, I've just drawn a sort of example function here on the left with these red arrows. We can say, well, okay, that's sending M to U and N to V. And so if we now think of M as this sort of left connected component of X and N as this sort of right connected component of X, we can think, well, Yes, we can sort of cook up a corresponding kind of arrow in this category of graphs because we can think that there's going to be a graph morphism which sends the entire sort of left connected component of X, this connected component M, it sends that into this point U while it sends the other connected component sort of corresponding to M, it sends that to this point V. So this is really mapping the different com connected components of our graph X to these kind of points in a way which is matching how our kind of function F on the left here is mapping these kind of connected components to different elements. And so we can always do that whenever we have any kind of function F from sigma of some x to some a and we can go the other way as well right so let's say we we start with this graph morphism on the right here so this is going to be a kind of graph morphism from this graph x to this kind of graph full of these isolated points and such a graph morphism is always going to be sending um, everything in a particular connected component to the same point OK, so so if we then sort of think of our graph as partitioned up into its connected components, so this is connected component M and this is connected component N, then we can see that our graph morphism is always going to be sending everything in a particular connected component to a particular loop in delta of A. And if we just look at how that happens, we can say, oh, well, we're sending stuff in connected component M to U and we're sending stuff in connected component N to V. And that lets us go the other way. That lets us go from something in this HOM set on the right to something in this HOM set on the left. OK, so um, that's basically how this sort of natural isomorphism works and like I say when you're trying to understand uh, the nature of adjoint functors this kind of method uh, is surprisingly powerful especially if you know the functors involved and you're just trying to actually work out the details of how they're adjoint functors um, it's surprising how often one can actually guess the nature of this sort of natural isomorphism here. I mean, of course, there's more work to do if we're doing this properly. We then want to check that this kind of isomorphism is really natural and define it properly. And then we probably want to get the unit and the co-unit and all the rest of it. But you can do all that. It's, um, it's sort of quite mechanical once you've guessed the nature of, I mean, there's there's a well-known method to go from this kind of natural isomorphism to get the unit and the co-unit involved um, in the adjoint for the adjoint functors. But this kind of method really lets you kind of get going in many different situations.
Anyway, I know my discussion of these adroit functors has been a bit hand wavy, but, but we're going to come back to this issue later in a more sort of rigorous way when we've got more tools to be applied to it. So if you have two functors, like uh, say this sigma and delta, which you think are adjoint, then this kind of method, it is a bit of a hack, but it's surprising how well it works. So if you just sort of try by doing some examples to put these different HOM sets in one-to-one -one correspondence, find ways to convert between the two different kinds of arrows, then, um, you know, there's if you can find a way to do that for every arrow, then um, it's fairly, fairly easy to check if that's um, if that kind of isomorphism is natural in X and A, and then you pretty much proved that you have these adjoint functors and you can get all the rest of the gizmo. So it's one of those many situations in category theory where you just kind of ask yourself how to produce something of a given sort of type and if you can do it then usually the kind of the only thing that you could think of which would work in every example turns out to be the right thing um so anyway let's um have another look at another kind of functor which is adjoint to our diagonal fun functor delta so here's another functor pi which goes from graphs to sets OK, and this is actually the right adjoint to this diagonal functor delta. So the way that this pi works is it essentially sends a graph to its set of points. So remember, a point of a graph is essentially an edge which connects a vertex to itself. OK, um, or we could think of it as an arrow into that graph from the terminal object in the category of graphs. And so the idea of uh, this pi functor is that it sends a graph x to the set of points of graph x. So for example, this graph x I've drawn here has these points with these self loops d, b, and c. And therefore pi of x is just the set d, b, and c. And also, if we have an arrow between graphs, like we have this arrow alpha from this graph x to this graph y, then um, pi of alpha is just going to be this function which maps points in a similar way to how alpha works on those kind of self loops. OK, um, so it's, it's a really straightforward kind of functor. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it's the kind of right adjoint to this diagonal. But the interesting thing is that it's this right adjoint to this diagonal functor delta. So um, you might want to pause the video now and see if you can actually convince yourself of that before I go through it. Because, again, we're going to be using this kind of informal but surprisingly effective kind of method of just finding a one-to-one -one correspondence between those different kinds of arrows. So let's do it. So now this is the sort of equation that we want to use. So we're saying that for any, so we're saying that for any set A in graph X, we're going to have that the arrows from delta of A to X are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the arrows from a to pi of x within the category set. And so basically, if you can find a way to convert an arrow in the category of graphs like this, from delta a to x into an arrow like this, and it's a sort of invertible way, then that's probably, uh, if, that, if you can do this for all x and a, then you've probably found the sort of nature of this um, of this kind of a junction here. Now, um, to be more precise, of course, you want to have this one-to-one -one correspondence, this isomorphism between these HOM sets, and you also want to check that it's natural in a and x. But like I was saying, 
Um, usually, if you can just figure out how to put these things in one-to-one -one correspondence, if you do it in a fairly natural way, then you'll have probably found this kind of natural isomorphism which lies behind this adjunction. And once you've got that, you can get all the rest of the kind of gadgetry involved in this kind of adjunction, the unit and co-unit and so on. Anyway, so let's try and do this then. Um, so we'll just do an example. So here we've got a set A at the top right, and here we've got a graph X at the bottom left. And let's now have an arrow in our category of graphs, which goes from delta of A to X. So maybe we send one to B and we send two to C. Now, the important thing is that in these graph morphisms, we always have to send points to points, okay? Because essentially when we're doing a graph morphism, we're really just sort of folding the structure of the source graph onto the target graph. Um, and so these self loops always have to get sent to self loops. So therefore for this arrow alpha from the graph delta A to the graph X, there's going to be this corresponding function and the way that this works is that the kind of points of delta A uh, correspond to the elements of A. And each of those kind of points of delta A is sent to a loop in X, a self loop. And if we just then map the elements of A in a similar manner, so for example, corresponds with this loop one in delta A, which got mapped to the loop B in X. And so we just want to send one to B. And in a similar way, since alpha sends loop two to loop C, this corresponding function should send point two to C, because C is this kind of element of pi of X, which is corresponding to this loop or self loop or point C of the original graph X. So basically we can just cook up this function on the right, which maps these elements in a similar way to our graph morphism maps, these self loops. So we could go the other way around as well. Okay, if we started with this function uh, from A to pi of X, then we can make a kind of corresponding function from delta A to X. So if we just look at the sort of points of delta A, they're gonna to correspond to the elements of A. And then if we just map those to the kind of points of X, which correspond to the things in pi of X, um, where stuff got mapped to, then that'll do the trick. So in particular, we say, okay, one got sent to B. So here I'll send this self loop one to B and two got sent to C, so I'll send this self loop T two to C. And this is clearly a way to put these two different kinds of arrows, arrows in here and arrows in here, in one-to-one -one correspondence. And it turns out, as you can check, that this kind of isomorphism is natural in both A and X. So this has just been a bit of an informal kind of introduction to the matter I want to get into today. And so now I'm going to generalize things a little bit, and I'm going to sort of keep generalizing as we go through. So the next thing is what about this diagonal functor? We've seen that it's pretty important, right? Because it has this left adjoint sigma, which tells us about the connected components of graphs, and it has this right adjoint pi, which tells us about the points of graphs. But, um, is this an isolated example or can we generalize things more? Well, what about if we want to work in a different kind of category of structured sets? I mean, we've been dealing with set to the power of this category with two parallel arrows. This category of graphs is really this category of functors from this category with two parallel arrows to set. But um, why do we have to be so constrained? Couldn't we instead think about general structured sets? So how about set to the power of C for some small category C? When I say a small category, I mean a category where the 
objects and arrows form sets. Okay. Um, so can we deal with something like that? Well, yes, we can. And then in that case, what would be a diagonal functor? Is there a sort of generalization of this idea? Well, yes, there is. So here's a sort of generalization then. Um, if we just put a, a sort of general category C up here, then we can think, well, there's going to be this sort of diagonal functor from set to this kind of category of structured sets, which basically is going to send a set D to this functor delta D. Now, delta D is going to be a functor from C to set. And it's actually just going to send all of the objects in C to this object D in set. And it's going to send all the arrows in C to the identity arrow of D in set. So maybe I can draw this thing out, okay? Here's set. And here's this set D. And then here we've got this uh, functor category set to the power of C. And what D gets sent to under this diagonal functor delta is this functor which goes from C. And I'll just draw a sort of generic category to represent C. So there's C. And then there's this functor from C to set, which just basically sends all of the stuff in um, in C to this object D and it sends all the arrows in C to the identity arrow of D. And this entire functor is what delta sends D to. Okay, so this is delta of D over here. And then you might ask, well, what does this functor do to arrows in set? And it just sends those to kind of natural transformations, which have each of their components equal to that arrow that we're operating on. So in particular, if we have E here, then there's going to be a corresponding sort of um, constant functor sending everything in C to E. And so then the other question is, what happens if we have an arrow, say F from D to E in our category set, where does that get sent by this diagonal functor? And it's going to get sent to this kind of natural transformation, which is going to be a natural transformation from this functor from C to set um, to this other functor from C to set. And uh, this is going to be delta of F. And the way that this works is that it's a natural transformation and each of its components is just F. OK, so I've described how this uh, functor works sort of properly here. OK, um, but the thing is that we can actually generalize this a bit further and it's quite easy. Why don't we just replace set with some more general category? It doesn't actually change anything about the definition. It doesn't actually change anything about the sort of particulars of how this is set up. So instead of having set here, why don't we just have a general category? And so now we have this sort of totally general kind of diagonal functor. And this is what we're really interested in um, to start and so, and so now we have this sort of totally general diagonal functor. And now we're sort of getting towards these kind of quite interesting high level abstractions. So how does this diagonal functor work? Well, it just simply sends an object of category A to the constant functor from C to A, which sends everything in C to this object A or its identity arrow. Um, and then the way that this diagonal functor works on arrows of A, for example, this arrow F, is it just sends them to natural transformations which have each of their components equal to that arrow. 
So it's quite sort of straightforward, really. In fact, I think this is uh, something I've already discussed in a previous video. So it'll actually be really useful if you can find this. So I'll I'll look it up exactly where I say it and put the time stamp on the screen. But um, the video is Category Theory for Beginners Limits. And I think there I actually talk about um, the one of the sort of fundamental things we're going to use to pull ourselves up towards can extensions. Um, and that's really to do with this diagonal functor. So let me just say the idea in, in a nutshell, okay? We've already seen we have this kind of situation for graphs. And now what we're going to do is generalize this massively. So instead of having to have this category with two parallel arrows up here, we can have a general category C, a small category. And instead of having this category set, we can have just some general category A. And now we have this more general kind of idea of a diagonal functor. And the really interesting thing is that in many useful situations, this um, diagonal functor is again going to have a left adjoint sigma and a right adjoint pi. And, and these functors turn out to be really useful. In fact, and this is the sort of remarkable thing, it turns out that this right functor here is basically a functor which gives us limits of things, whereas this left functor basically gives us co-limits. Um, now, this isn't always possible. It depends on the nature of the category A, but in many sort of practical situations, in particular when A is set, this is always the case. And we get these remarkable functors which actually tell us all the limits and co-limits of things. And moreover, this kind of setup has a lot to do with some really important things in mathematics. So I've already talked about how this is important for graphs and you can pick any kind of category of structured sets and you can look at this kind of situation, what these left and right adjoint functors are. And you'll find lots and lots of remarkable functors that teach you all sorts of things about different kinds of spaces. So for example, you could do this for categories of dynamical systems, which would be set to the power of this uh, additive monoid of natural numbers. Um, or you can do this for or you can do this for categories of simplicial sets, or you can do this for categories of functions. Um, and what we're going to look at is this in a particular case, which relates well to dependent type theory. And that's very revealing because it sort of reveals some of the sort of fundamental operations going on in dependent type theory. And we see that they basically just come out as sort of adjoint functors to this diagonal functor in a particular case. So, okay, so this is the kind of situation we're interested in then. We have this diagonal functor, which sends an object of A to the kind of functor, which sends everything in C to that object, the kind of constant functor. And we're interested in potentially calculating the left and right adjoints to this functor delta. Now, it might not be the case that those adjoints exist, but if A is a kind of well-behaved category in quotes, then these adjoints will exist. And when they exist, they have to do with co-limits and limits. So for example, if A is set, then these left and right adjoints, sigma and pi, always exist. So this is what we're interested in to begin with. Okay, so we're interested now in this kind of general situation. And um, we really want to think about this diagonal functor in general. And we want to think about the left and right adjoints 
of this diagonal functor. We're interested in how these give rise to limits. And there's a couple of reasons we're interested in this. It's, it's a nice kind of um, middle of the road kind of uh, situation to think about because on one hand, this situation that we just saw with the graphs, we can understand what's going on there from a sort of higher viewpoint by thinking about this. And on the other hand, um, we can generalize what's going on here even further and get to can extensions. So let's um, make sure, uh, I've maybe labored this point a bit too much, but let's just make sure we understand what this diagonal functor does, okay? It sends an object in A to the functor that sends everything in C to that object, okay? It sends an object in A to the kind of constant functor defined using that object, okay? Um, and then it, it turns arrows between objects in A to the sort of natural transformations between those corresponding constant functors. And those natural transformations just have every component equal to that arrow that we used, okay? Um, so it won't always be the case that this diagonal functor has a left and a right adjoint, but in the case where we have the C is small, okay, so it has its collection of objects and arrows form sets. And also in the case where A is what they call bicomplete, It will be the case that this uh, functor, this diagonal functor delta will have a left and a right adjoint. What does bicomplete mean? That just means that A is complete and co-complete. So we say a category is complete when it has all small limits. So there's a limit for every functor coming from a small category into it. And we say that a category is co-complete when there's a co-limit of every functor coming into it from a small category. So to say that a category is bi-complete is to say that it's complete and co-complete, which is to say that every functor coming into it from a small category like RC is going to have a limit and a co-limit. And therefore, since we can work out all these limits in this case, we can basically be sure that these uh, functors sigma and pi, as I'm about to describe, uh, do actually exist because um, they basically make loads of stuff to do with limits. And when we can make the stuff to do with limits, we can make those functors and we can find these adjoints, left and right adjoints to delta. So there's lots of examples of um, bi-complete categories. So categories where we can do this and a couple of really great examples are set. So when we're dealing with set, there's fairly straightforward ways to actually compute limits and co-limits. And so it's very lovely in that case because we can really get our hands on the, um, I mean, you know, for example, how to calculate the product of a couple of sets. And that's an example of a limit. But in fact, any limit can be computed in a very kind of similar hands-on way in set. And another example of a bi-complete category is cat, which is another very lovely example. Um, I think limits are sort of doable in cat. Co-limits are also doable, but there's um, things get a bit more involved for co-equalizers. But anyway, so we know how this diagonal functor delta works. So what we're interested in now is talking about these other functors. So I'm going to start by talking about pi um, because this is really kind of like the, we could almost call it the limit functor. Okay, so let me describe how it works. So pi is going to send an object x of this functor category, a to the power of c, to the apex of the limit cone um, of this functor. 
x from c to a. So let me just give you a sort of one minute reminder of what a limit actually is. Here we go. So this is basically the situation that we're talking about. So we have this category C. And if we pick an object W of A, then we can consider the functor, which is what we might call delta of W. OK, so delta of W is itself a functor. It's a functor from C to A. And what it does is it sends all of the objects and all of the arrows of C into A. All right, that's that constant functor. Now, we also have another functor in this picture, which is X. OK, that's kind of the functor that we're interested in finding a limit of. And a cone is a natural transformation from one of these constant functors to X. So if we have a natural transformation mu like this, that's what we call a cone. And you see why it's called a cone, because we can visualize it as um, a sort of apex W together with this family of arrows uh, coming down, which form all these triangles, which commute with the kind of uh, things in the diagram, like X of um, arrows of category C. So a limit cone is a special kind of cone. It's kind of like the best one in some sense. And so um, since I said that the apex of our limit cone is called pi x, I've labeled the apex of our limit cone as pi x in this case, but I could have called it something different. So a limit cone is another cone. So um, we can visualize it again by saying there's a functor. Uh, in this case, we'll say delta of pi of x and that's going to send all of the objects of c to this apex pi of x so everything gets sent like this and then again there's going to be a natural transformation in this case phi from this sort of special apex to x and this is forming our limit cone so this is a special kind of cone so it has the same kind of form as any other cone it it consists of an apex which we're calling pi of x together with a natural transformation from the constant functor to that apex to x uh, which forms the sort of walls of the um, or the sort of downwards arrows of this cone structure here but it's a limit cone in the sense that it's sort of the best cone in the sense that for any other cone like this one formed by mu and w um, there's a unique way to sort of emulate what's going on with that other kind of candidate cone like this green one with mu here in the sense that there's an ex a unique arrow h from w to the apex of our limit cone so if there's a unique arrow h from w to pi of x which has the property that that arrow commutes with these walls of these different cones so doing phi of ci after h equals mu of ci for every object ci in the category c so what i'm saying is that there's this kind of unique intermediary arrow which is going to commute um, with the sort of corresponding walls of the cone for any particular object of C. Um, so that's a very, very quick run over the definition of a cone. In So that's a very, very quick run over the definition of a limit cone. Um, and here's the same kind of thing said a bit more algebraically. Okay, so the limit cone of 
a functor x from c to a is going to be a cone so it's going to be a natural transformation um, from delta of pi of x to x where pi of x denotes the apex of a limit cone and it's having the property that for any cone so for example this mu which is a natural transformation from delta w to x there's going to exist this unique arrow between the apexes of our cones so this unique arrow h from the apex of our candidate cone to our apex of our limit cone which has the property that phi of ci after h equals mu of ci for every object ci of our category c so there we go uh, that's what a limit is in that's what a limit is in general and the reason i'm calling the apex of our limit cone pi of x is just because that's how i'm defining pi here i haven't told you how pi works on arrows yet but i'm saying that the way that it works on objects is that it takes an object x in this functor category here in other words it takes a functor x from c to a and it sends that kind of object x to the apex of the limit cone of that functor x now the astute amongst you might be thinking well um the limit cone is not always defined uniquely but it is defined up to isomorphism okay so it doesn't it doesn't really matter how you how you exactly pick the object but you just pick a particular limit for every functor and in a sense it doesn't matter how you do that because all those limits are isomorphic anyway so now you know how this pi functor works on objects the next question is how does it work on arrows and this is something which um, I'm going to get into in detail shortly. So I thought I'd simply tell you how it works at the moment without too much sort of build up. And then I, I don't usually like to do this in category theory. I like to sort of talk through the steps and the kind of ideas a bit more carefully. But in this case, I'm just going to tell you how this uh, pi works on arrows and then we're going to see this from another angle very shortly so hopefully it'll make more sense then um so firstly what is an arrow in a to the power of c well it's going to be a natural transformation between two functors okay so here's the kind of picture um we're thinking about functors and we've got one of these functors x which is sort of giving us this diagram um, given by the black arrows in category a and when we've got another and then we've got another functor uh, which we can call x dash and that's giving us another diagram and our arrow from x to x dash in this functor category well that's really going to be a natural transformation so we could call that alpha and that's going to be a natural transformation from x to x dash and so in our picture that's going to look something like this uh, the component for c1 is going to be alpha c1 that's going to be an arrow from x of c1 to x dash of c1 and we're going to have sort of corresponding arrows for every object of category c um and so okay so given all this stuff uh, that should be a x dash there by the way that's the apex of the limit cone of the functor x dash anyway given all this stuff what we're really after is an arrow from pi of x to pi of x dash so remember we have this natural transformation alpha from functor x to functor x dash so this is really an arrow in a to the power of c uh, and so what we're really interested in is getting some kind of a arrow pi of alpha i'll draw it dotted okay pi of alpha and it turns out that what we want is the unique arrow which commutes with all of these sides of these cones okay um so in particular i'll just rub out that for a second um 
if we compose, so in particular, if we compose these kind of arrows with these yellow ones, then that's those that kind of composition uh, is really going to be forming a sort of cone of X dash. Okay, so this is an interesting idea. Composing these yellow arrows with these red arrows on the left gives us a load of arrows from pi of X into the diagram of X dash. Okay, like this and like this and like this. Okay, and then what we can think is that, well, this is actually the apex of a real limit cone of uh, X dash. And then these new kind of composition things that we formed basically are forming like a candidate cone for X dash. And therefore, there's going to be a unique arrow from pi of X to pi of X dash, which commutes with the sides of these cones. And that's actually what we call pi of alpha. So that's going to be where this pi functor sends this natural transformation alpha from x to x dash to. Um, so basically the way that this pi functor works is it sends functors to the apexes of the limit cones and it sends natural transformations between functors to the kind of um, unique arrows between those apexes which commute with the kind of structure that you build using that natural transformation. Um, I think in this case it's actually easier to see what's going on by looking at a cleaner kind of picture because this gets a bit busy. Um, so here's another kind of way of saying it. If we have a natural transformation alpha from this functor x to this functor x dash. So this alpha, we can really think of it as an arrow in a to the power of c. Well, then there's going to be this unique arrow pi of alpha from pi of x to pi of x dash, which is going to be such that this square commutes. for every object CI of the category C. So in particular, we're going to have alpha CI after phi of CI equals phi of CI dash after pi of alpha. Okay. And that's going to happen. And there's going to be a unique arrow pi of alpha that makes this kind of square commute um, for every object CI of the category C. And why does this work like this? Well, basically because composing alpha CI after phi of CI gives us an arrow from pi of X to X dash of CI. And we can do this for every object CI of the category C. And that really forms a kind of candidate cone, which we can compare with the real cone, uh, phi dash. Uh, so here, phi dash. is a natural transformation from delta of pi of x dash to x dash and that's the real limit cone uh, for this functor x dash and then comparing this with this kind of candidate cone that we build with composition means that we have this kind of unique intermediary arrow by the sort of universal properties of the limit cones um, and that's what gives us this uh, pi of alpha here. But anyway, we're going to see another approach at this. So we're going to understand this more clearly very soon. Okay, so now we've hopefully described how this uh, diagonal functor delta and this other sort of limit functor pi are defined. Uh, we're in a position to start talking about this kind of fact that they're adjoint functors. So in particular, that pi is the right adjoint to this functor delta. And so there are various ways to get at this. Um, one way is, again, using this kind of 
way of looking at our joint functors using home sets. So if we can find a natural isomorphism, natural in A and X, between this set of arrows from delta of A to X in the functor category, and this set of arrows from A to pi of X in the category A, well then we've basically um, understood the nature of this kind of adjunction here. Um, and you can have a look at this adjoint and you can have a look at this situation for yourself. You can see if you can come up with a um, sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between these HOM sets. And I bet if you do, you'll find that it's natural in A and X. And that will basically tell you the nature of this functor. Now, I'm going to take a different sort of perspective on um, this situation, which is another way to look at adjoint functors, which is using what we call the co-units. So you can see my video on adjoint functors to find out about how to convert between these different viewpoints, um, how to go sort of backwards and forwards between these different perspectives of looking at adjoint functors in terms of um, sort of one-to-one -one correspondences between HOM sets and looking at them in terms of units and co-units. Um, but yeah, like I say, I'm going to use the other kind of um, alternative view of adjoint functors. Um, but what we're going to do is look at another way we can think about this kind of adjunction here using this co-unit. Okay then, so we have this sort of view of adjoint functors in terms of this kind of natural isomorphism between these sorts of HOM sets. And that's fine. In fact, I have heard that that's the way that adjoint functors were originally discovered. However, um, there's another view of them which I actually prefer in many ways, and it's a rather different sort of view. And it's really the kind of perspective that if we ha have two adjoint functors and we know about one of them, then we can find the other one. And that's really great because th from that kind of perspective, you can view adjoint functors as things which are waiting to be discovered, kind of concepts, important concepts, which you can work out. And I must say that category theory is really extraordinary in this regard, in the fact that you can get a really kind of creative and coherent concept being generated almost automatically by doing the right kind of computations. Um, now, in order to look at, now in order to look at um, adjoint functors from this kind of point of view, we're really going to be thinking about universal constructions or universal morphisms. So um, although I did tell myself I'm not going to go too much back into the theory of adjoint functors because it's um, it's difficult to um, make progress describing something like can extensions if one's always going back into the background and sort of talking about the underlying ideas because there's so many underlying ideas. But still, I am going to do this for adjoint functors a little bit. So we'll go to this general kind of situation where we have categories D and E and this functor L is the left adjoint to this functor R in a similar way to how this functor delta is the left adjoint to this functor pi. And so we can view this situation in terms of HOM sets in the way that we've already encountered several times. But there's basically this other sort of viewpoint, another equivalent way to define adjoint functors, which is to say that if we take this functor L as known, then we have a kind of way of using universal morphisms to determine this functor R. And basically it works like I've written here in orange. Now, um, this is basically just almost word for word the same as something which appears 
in my video on add joint funk tools where I introduce these ideas much more slowly and in a way that's probably easier to understand. But I thought it's worth recapping this stuff because it's it's quite involved. Um, so here goes. This functor R is going to be the right adjoint of this functor L, which goes in the opposite direction, if and only if two conditions are met. The first condition is that for every object D in our category bold D, we have a terminal morphism R of D comma epsilon D from L to D. So um, that's the first condition. And then this, and so this first condition really describes how uh, this functor R works on objects. But um, it involves this idea of terminal morphisms. And so I'll just go for a quick recap of the definition of a terminal morphism, because that's really a very kind of central idea for us. Um, so here's a quick recap of the idea of a terminal morphism. So let's say we have two general categories, D and E, and we have a functor L from E to D, and we have an object um, D in this category, bold D. So what's it mean for us to have a terminal morphism from L to D? Well, such a terminal morphism is going to be a pair like this of an object V in category E and an arrow epsilon dash from L of V to D. And it has a special property that for any kind of similar setup, so for any object W in E together with an arrow from L of W to D, let's say M, there exists, there exists a unique arrow from W to V, let's say a unique intermediary arrow I, such that L of I makes this triangle on the left commute in the sense that epsilon dash after L of I equals M. So it basically means that there's a unique kind of intermediary arrow which can be used to emulate any kind of candidates. And that's what makes this um, terminal morphism uh, V comma epsilon dash, the kind of um, universal morphism from L to D. And a universal morphism from L to D is just another phrase which means the same thing as a terminal morphism from L to D. So this is really this idea of universal properties. And the way this works for adjoint functors is that, and the way this works for adjoint functors is that if we have a functor R, which is the right adjoint to L, then we can basically define R, we can define how it works on objects, at least up to isomorphism, to say that um, R is going to send an object D to an object R of D, which is such that R of D comma epsilon subscript D is going to be a terminal morphism from L to D, okay? So it's basically just the same setup as we just had. It's just that we have a terminal morphism from L to D for every object D in our category, um, bold D. 
and um, we sort of use those terminal morphisms to define um, how R works on objects. And that also gives us this family of arrows. So we're going to have a arrow epsilon D from L after R of D to D for every object D of our category. And that actually defines this natural transformation epsilon from L after R to the identity arrow of D. And that's called the co-unit. So this is kind of part of the story, but the rest is kind of self, well, it's self-explanatory if you think about it enough, okay? So it turns out then that um, we can also define how our functor R works on arrows as well um, by thinking more about this, because if we have basically a terminal morphism like this, from L to D for every object D, then um, we can use that to actually define how, um, well, we can use that to define some special kind of ways of lifting arrows. And basically we can define how this right adjoint um, functor works on arrows. So basically the way this works, suppose we have an arrow H from an object D to an object D dash in our category bold D. And we want to actually do this functor R upon such an arrow. Well, we notice that doing height, well, we notice that since D dash is an object of category D, um, we know that there's going to be a sort of terminal morphism from L to D dash. And that's going to be what's behind defining R of D dash. Okay, so we're going to have R of D dash over here. And we're going to have this arrow from L of R of D dash into D dash, which is epsilon D dash. But now here's the thing. Um, we know that this arrow epsilon D dash is basically part of this sort of terminal morphism from L to D dash. But we can also think of this composition, this uh, H after epsilon D as a kind of candidate for being a kind of terminal morphism uh, from L to D dash, a kind of failing candidate. And therefore there's going to exist this unique arrow, which we'll actually define as R of H, which has the property that if we do L on it, it kind of closes this triangle and makes this triangle commute. So L of R of H is this. So basically we define R of H to be the unique arrow such that if we do L on it, we get this arrow which makes this square on the left commute here and so that's how we define how our right adjoint works on arrows and this is what I've spelled out here I'm not going to um, read it all out because I've already gone through the example and you can pause the video if you want to um, look at this more so but this is the kind of idea of how we can think about um, this idea that if we know r is the right adjoint to l and we know the nature of L, then we can determine the nature of R. And it's also possible to go the other way around. Okay, so when we're going this way around, we're sort of getting this natural transformation, um, this sort of so-called co-unit here, um, which is kind of defining these terminal morphisms. Um, now, you can look at things from the other perspective, and you can kind of determine L from R and there you see a different kind of special uh, natural transformation, which is called the unit. And that has this kind of form.
and that's related to initial morphisms. So uh, the whole thing is all very pleasant, um, but for us, we want to understand about the kind of emergence of this kind of functor uh, pi here, which has to do with limits. And so what we're going to do is to see that this kind of definition I've written in orange here, if we just think about what this means and pretty much just read it off directly, we'll see the idea of limits emerge kind of straight out of the page. Um, so it's really quite a remarkable thing. Okay, so we've just done this general description of right adjoints. And now what we want to do is apply this to this particular case. And we really want to see now that this functor pi is the right adjoint to this functor delta. So what we're going to do is we're going to just apply this definition we were just discussing and sort of pretend that we don't really know what pi is, that we only really know that it's the right adjoint to delta. So we just write this, but with the appropriate symbol replacements to make... So we're just going to write this, but with the appropriate symbol replacements to make it so that we're actually talking about this situation instead. So here we have it. So this is the necessary and sufficient condition for pi to be the right adjoint to this functor delta. And so there are sort of two parts to this condition. Part one is about terminal morphisms and part two is about how this functor works on arrows. So let's focus on the first part, okay? It says that for every object X in our functor category, so for every functor X from C to A, we have a terminal morphism, pi of X comma epsilon X from delta to X. So let's focus on that first because this is really actually telling us how our pi functor works on objects. And this is the picture. And this is well worth understanding because this is actually the definition of a limit cone. So what do we have here? We have this object X in our functor category. So that's a functor from C to A. Now, we also have a terminal morphism from delta to X. What is that? Well, it's going to be an object pi of x in this category a, that'll turn out to be the apex of our limit cone, but we'll see that momentarily. And that's together with this arrow epsilon x, which goes from delta of pi of x to x. So why don't we call that epsilon x phi to reconnect with notation we've previously used. So do you see it now? This phi is a natural transformation from the constant functor that sends everything to pi of x to x. So it's a cone, right? This, um, when we do pi, so it's a cone, right? So when we do delta on pi of x, that's giving us the functor from C to A that sends everything in C to pi of X. And the natural transformation from that to X is just going to be a cone. So it's just this same situation that we've pictured up here. And in fact, we're going to see that this phi here, which we're also now calling epsilon X, um, this phi is and we're also seeing that this phi here, which we're also calling epsilon x, we're going to see that this isn't just a cone, it's actually a limit cone. And we can see that because the kind of universal property that that cone is supposed to have is exactly stated here, okay? Because the fact that pi of x comma epsilon x is a terminal morphism from delta to x, means precisely that for any W 
and arrow mu from delta w to x, we have that there exists a unique h such that phi after delta h equals mu. And all of this stuff on the left, this is just vertical composition of natural transformations. It's just component-wise composition. So this condition I just stated is exactly this condition. We want to make something to be a limit cone, which is just this kind of idea pictured here that if we have another cone, say with an apex W and sides defined by a natural transformation mu, then there's going to exist this unique H which commutes with the sides of the cones and allows us to construct these parts of this sort of phony candidate cone, mu. So the remarkable thing is that this definition here um, is precisely, so the remarkable thing that we can see from this picture here is that a limit cone of X is precisely a terminal morphism from delta to x. And moreover, we can see from this point one here that basically the way that this is telling us that pi is working is that pi is sending an object x to the apex of the limit cone of x because we have this stuff involved with this terminal morphism, which is essentially defining a limit cone for us. So we can think of pi really as being defined as sending an object x to the apex of the limit cone of x. Okay, so that's part one. That tells us about how this functor pi here works on objects. And then the other part two tells us how this functor pi works on arrows. And so what it says is that for an arrow alpha from x to x dash, we're going to have that pi of alpha is the unique arrow that makes this square commute. Okay, so this is just lifted straight from this sort of um, way of defining the right adjoint functor. But if we look at this condition, if we go back, it's actually precisely this condition here that we have this pi of alpha here and that this is the unique arrow such that if we choose any ci then we're always going to have that alpha ci after phi of ci equals phi dash of ci after pi of alpha okay So if we just look at this condition and we want to write this as phi and this is phi dash and we look at how this, um, what this natural, because I mean, this is just like saying that these natural transformations composing them along either of these paths gives the same results. And that basically just means that that happens for every component of these natural transformations. So if we look at the sort of, component wise version of this information how it works on the individual components of the natural transformations then yeah you get exactly that condition that i just pointed out so yeah this is exactly how we expected um a sort of arrow between objects in the functor category to get mapped to a sort of arrow between the apexes of their limit cones. So there you have it. This really succinctly describes the nature of limits. And we get it straight out of thinking about adjoint functors. Now, uh, things are going to start getting really interesting now. What we're going to do, while we've got all this, um, all these ideas in mind, we'll quickly talk about how we can sort of dualize these ideas and think about co-limits because that's in a very sort of dual way going to tell us the nature of this sigma functor here this left adjoint of delta and then what we're going to do is apply this very general theory to graphs and we're going to see again where those functors we saw at the beginning came from and then 
we're going to see how all of this theory is really just a special case of something much more general and interesting. I mean, this is pretty interesting in itself, but when we get to can extensions, it's like going through the sky. It's quite amazing. Okay, so let's just recap. We have talked about this diagonal functor, and we've talked about how it has this right adjoint pi, and most notably, we've seen that just by applying a certain kind of perspective on what the right adjoint of a functor is, we've seen the nature of this functor as something that sends a uh, member of this category to it, the apex of its limit cone. We've seen that that just falls straight out of a kind of certain way of looking at what adjoint functors are, this way of looking at them using the co-unit. And we can basically do something very similar for the left adjoint of this diagonal functor delta. We can do something very similar for this functor sigma, which it turns out actually sends a member of a to the power of c to the apex of its co-limit. Now, once again, I'm sort of trying to tread a line between uh, making sure that I've defined enough of what's going on that people can follow it and sort of overburdening the audience with um, excessive um, sort of turning back to see how previous things are defined. Because I have talked about left adjoints in some detail in my video on adjoint functors. So I'm going to be a bit brief here. Um, so basically, We've so basically there's this sort of homset based definition of adjoint functors, and I think that's a good one for starters. Um, but then we've just been looking at this other perspective on adjoint functors, which is really sort of using the co unit and this idea of terminal morphisms. And this is great if you want to work out the right adjoint to a functor, but there's a sort of dual idea of this, which lets you go the other way around. So it lets you determine what the left adjoint is if you have the right one, okay? It lets you go the other way around. And that idea is very similar to this one, but instead of being based on terminal morphisms and the co-units, it's based on initial morphisms and the units. So if these seem alien to you, again, I encourage you to look at my video on adjoint functors, um, but I will just briefly go through the sort of dual version of this kind of statement, this kind of way of talking about adjoint functors. And so here it is. So once again, we'll, so in this case, we imagine that we have these categories D and E, and we have a functor R from D to E, and we want to work out the left adjoint of R. So we want to work out this functor L from E to D. And this result basically tells us how to do it. So for every object E in this category, bold E here, we want an initial morphism. I'll talk about what an initial morphism is momentarily, but we want an initial morphism L of E comma E to subscript E from E to R. And in getting an initial morphism like that, that enables us to actually find out how this functor L works on this object E of our category here. So, okay, I should say at this point then, what is an initial morphism? And it's basically just the kind of dual of the notion of a terminal morphism. So this is the sort of picture. So, um, we have these two categories, D and E, and we have a functor R from D to E. So what's an initial morphism from E to R? That's what we're interested in here, okay? So what that is, is it's a pair of an object V in this category D and an arrow E to dash from E to R of V, 
which has the property that for anything sort of similar, so for any object W in D, um, such that there's an arrow, let's say, K, from E to R of W, there's a unique way to sort of emulate how that arrow works. So in particular, so in particular, there's going to be a unique arrow from V to W, let's call it H, such that R of H makes this diagram commute. Okay, so it's pretty much the dual idea to the notion of terminal morphisms, which we've previously seen. What does this have to do with working out the left adjoint? Well, when we're working out the left adjoint, basically, um, well, there's a couple of things to say here. One of them is that both of these um, initial morphisms and terminal morphisms, they're collectively called universal morphisms. Okay, so either one of them, you can call it a universal morphism. It's just whether it goes uh, from a functor to an object or from an object to a functor, which defines whether it's terminal or initial. So anyway, yeah, the, the point is that um, these universal morphisms are always defined up to isomorphism. So when I say, for example, that V comma E to dash is an initial morphism from E to R, that actually tells us the nature of um, this pair V comma E to dash up to isomorphism. So is usual, so if it's the usual case in category theory where we're only really interested in how things are defined up to isomorphism anyway, then um, it's you know essentially just saying that something is an initial morphism from E to R is defining it properly. Okay, it's very very similar. Well, it's it's pretty much the same as the situation where we're talking about the co-product of a pair of objects in a category. What the co-product of a pair of objects is, is not uniquely defined, but any co-product co of the same pair of objects will be isomorphic. And it's similar for these kind of universal morphisms. So that's the first thing. So the other thing is that using what I've written in orange here, we can really think about the way that this left adjoint L of R works on objects as being defined in terms of these initial morphisms. So in particular, this functor L from E to D, this left adjoint of R, well, well in this case, we want L of E comma E to subscript E to be an initial morphism from E to R. So it's like this picture, but instead of a V here, we're gonna have L of E. And then this red arrow on the right is gonna be going from E to R of L of E. And this is going to be the ETH component of our unit. So then this unit is um, this other kind of natural transformation, which is like part of the crucial information about the uh, adjoint functors. And um, it's this natural transformation from the identity functor of E to R after L. And so this is what we call the unit. And so now we've seen these three sort of equivalent ways of looking at what adjoint functors are. So like I say, we have this kind of way of looking at adjoint functors where we're focusing on how to work out the left adjoint of a functor R. And I wrote how to do this in orange here. I made a little typo here, which I've now corrected. Um, And so if we just apply this in our special case where we're interested in computing sigma as the left adjoint of delta, then we'll see the definition of co-limits fall straight out. So let's just do that now. 
So these are the sort of substitutions that we want to make, like replacing D with A, for example. And so if we do this, this is what we have, that for every object X of A to the power of C, we have an initial morphism, sigma of X, comma, eta of X, from X to delta, and that's defining basically how sigma works on objects. And then the second part I'll get onto later is defining how sigma works on arrows. Well, let's have a look at the first part. What does that really mean? Well, this is the picture. So what we're saying is that if we have an X in A to the power of C, so that's going to be a functor from C to A, basically. Well, hopefully we want sigma of X to be the apex of the colimit cone of X. And let's see if that works. So, I mean, basically what's going on here is that sigma of X, together with this arrow eta of X, is forming an initial morphism from X to delta. And the key thing to realize is that such an initial morphism is precisely a colimit. Okay, so let me just write that out because it's very important. The critical point here really is that if we have an object X in this functor category, then what we have is that sigma of X together with this arrow eta of X, which we might also want to call phi, for example, that those two things form an initial morphism from X to delta. So the critical thing to realize here is that if we have an object X in this functor category here, and then we have an initial morphism from X to delta. So for example, we have this uh, sigma of X comma eta of X forming this initial morphism from X to delta. Well, the critical thing to realize is that that is exactly what a colimit of X actually is. Okay, why is this? Well, let's call eta of X phi, just to be consistent with our previous notation. So firstly, this is a natural transformation from this functor X to this kind of constant functor. And it's looking like sigma of X is going to be the apex of this colimit cocone. And indeed, that's the case because if we have any other cocone of X, so that would be having some apex W, and then the walls of the cocone would be defined by some natural transformation mu from X to delta of W, well, then there's going to be a sort of unique way to emulate how that sort of phony candidate's cocone works. In particular, there's a unique arrow H from the, from the apex of our real colimit cocone to the apex of our kind of candidate cocone, um, such that if we do delta on H, then we get this sort of natural transformation, um, which if we do it after phi, then we get mu, okay? So we're doing well. We're climbing up quite high on these levels of abstraction. So what we're going to do now is sort of step down a bit and look at what's going on here in more kind of um, specific scenarios. So in particular, we're going to start by considering what happens when this category A is set so in that case, these results here are going to have things to do with these kind of categories of structured sets. And then in particular, we can look at graphs. And we're going to see that these results, which we've already kind of obtained, um, are going to explain the nature of those um, sort of adjoint functors to do with connectivity, which we saw originally. And we're also going to 
point out how this stuff connects with dependent type theory. You don't need to know any dependent type theory to follow, but it's just a sort of um, interesting extra connection that's there, which I think is worthwhile pointing out. And all of this stuff is really looking at specific examples of what we've already been discussing. And then after that, we're going to sort of generalize. And then we're going to get on to proper can extensions in all their glory. OK, so what we're going to do now, we understand the general nature of these adjoint functors is we're going to have a look at a specific example in the category of sets. So in particular, we're now going to assume that A is set and we're going to assume that C is some small category. And part of the reason we're doing this is because set has this nice property that in this case where C is small, any functor from C to set has a limit and a co-limit. So that means that these kind of left, so that means that these kind of left and right adjoints are well defined. And also this example we talked about at the beginning of um, what's going on with our category of graphs when we had these functors coming from our diagonal functor which told us about the points or the connected components of a graph they're going to be a special case of what we're talking about now so let's start by talking about this functor pi this one that gives the limits this right adjoint of delta so this is the kind of picture that tells us how this functor pi works on objects and basically it sends an object x of set to the power of c so we can think of x as a kind of functor from c to set or we can think of x as a kind of structured set for example if uh, c is this category here then x would be a graph okay because we'd be talking about the category of graphs on the left in this case but we'll work at a bit more general level for the moment and we're interested then in um, if we have x what is pi of x and we already know it's going to be the apex of the limit cone of the functor x but the question is what does that look like so the real question that we're getting at here is what do limits look like of functors that go into set and it turns out that this question can be answered in general so this is brilliant because it means that when we're thinking about structured sets we're going to see that um, lots of the sort of computations that we're interested in have to do with working out limits and co-limits and we're going to see now that those things can be sort of computed exactly just like there's an easy way to find the product of two sets there's an easy way to find a limit of um, any uh, functor uh, from a small category into set. So I'll just introduce a little bit more notation. Um, so I wanted some notation to mean the product of a load of sets, as in the Cartesian product of many sets. And I'm already using pi um, for this functor. And I hate using the same symbols for different things. So I'm going to use pi with a tilde on top to denote um, this kind of Cartesian product operation on sets. So it's a very simple idea, really. So suppose, for example, we have um, a load of sets which are indexed. So, for example, S1, S2, S3. These are three sets indexed with these integers 1, 2 and 3. And so when we write this notation, we mean that we're taking the Cartesian product of these different sets, SI, from I from 1 to 3. So this just means the Cartesian product of these three sets, S1 times S2 times S3. And the uh, members of this kind of product, this set that we formed, are going to be these um, triples X of uh, three values, X1, X2, X3, where x1 is a member of s1 and x2 is a member of s2 and so on and this notation here 
just means that xi is an element of the set si. So, okay, we can use this notation now to describe uh, pi of capital X. So, okay, now we have this notation, we can see a general kind of expression for the apex of a limit cone of a functor into sets. So let's suppose we have a functor X from a category C to set. And um, here C can be any small category. We can think of it as this one that gives us a graph. Okay, so it could be that X is a graph if C has the right kind of form. But anyway, in general, we do have this expression here, which tells us what pi of X is. Okay, so remember pi of X is the apex of the limit cone of this functor X. And um, here's the kind of expression for this. Now this might not make sense on a first pass, but we're going to look at an example momentarily and then it should make a bit more sense. But um, here's how it works. Basically, uh, pi of X, this is going to be something in set. So this is going to be a set. And what it is, is it's the set of X, which belongs to the product of capital X of CI over all of the objects CI in the category C. Uh, but we don't want all of those tuples. We only want to take the ones X, little x, which have this kind of property here that I'm underlining in blue. And what this property says is that for every arrow F, in our category C, we have that if we sort of lift that arrow under our functor and then operate it on the Cith entry in our tuple, then we ought to get the Cj entry if F is an arrow from Ci to Cj in that category C. So in a nutshell, what this is saying is that to find the limit of a functor that goes into set, what we do is we take the Cartesian product of all of the kind of objects in that diagram that we want to find a limit of, and that gives us a load of tuples. And then we just pick out those tuples, which kind of play well with the arrows of our index category in the sense that for any arrow F, from CI to CJ, if we lift that arrow under the functor we're interested in, that'll give us a function. And if we operate that function, say that function goes from CI to CJ, well, we op well if we operate that function uh, on the CI entry of our tuple, we ought to get the CJ entry of our tuple. So that's how it works in a nutshell. It'll be a lot more clear when we have a look, as we're going to now, at how this works in the category of graphs. So we have this general kind of description of what the apex of a limit cone of a functor into set looks like. And now let's look at a specific example when we're thinking about graphs. Okay, so um, this will hopefully help us to understand the nature of these kind of limit cones. So um, here is our kind of index category for the category of graphs, this category of two parallel arrows. And then of course we know that um, for this category C, we have that set to the power of C is gonna be our category of graphs. And so we're now thinking that we have a particular graph. So that's really gonna correspond with a functor X from C to set. And then we're thinking, well, what's going to be the what's going to be a limit cone um, of that kind of functor? And in particular, what's the apex of that going to be? So of course, we've got this kind of diagram that we're looking at a limit of. So we've got the edge set of our graph, X of E, this is the vertex set and so on. And so we're now interested in what's this set pi of X, which is going to be forming the apex of our limit cone. And so there's going to be these kind of uh, arrows of this limit cone, like uh, phi subscript E and 
phi subscript v. And we'll get on to those in a minute. So, I mean, the kind of form of this limit cone is that we're going to have this kind of constant functor, which is delta of pi of x. And um, that's going to send everything in C to this pi of x here. And then the rest of the kind of information in the cone is described by this kind of natural transformation phi, which is defining the kind of walls of the cone. But um, for the moment, we're really interested in what's the nature of this set here, pi of x. What actually is this object in set, which is the apex of the limit cone of x. And we already have this kind of formula for this in general. And so what this is basically saying is that um, for every object ci in the category c, there's going to be a set x of ci. And if we take the product of all of those sets, the Cartesian product, that will give us a load of tuples. And then if we just sort of filter out the tuples which work well with the arrows of c, as is underlined in blue, then that will give us the sets that we want. So let's just apply this kind of expression to find pi of x in this case. And so this is what we're doing here. Um, we're saying that, and so this is what we're doing here. We're saying that pi of x consists of all of the pairs of an edge y of e together with the vertex y of v of our graph which have the property that the source of y of e is y of v and the target of y of e is y of v. So this is actually just going to be the set of self loops in our graph. Okay, remember how this functor works? Okay, it's going to send a graph to the set of loops it has. And we can see this even more explicitly. Okay, so um, if you think about it, we can kind of say that this is isomorphic to, or might as well be the same as, the set of all ye belonging to the edge set of our graph, which have the property that the source of that edge is equal to the target of that edge. Okay, so basically what this is saying is that we can just think of pi of x as the set of all edges that have the same source as their target. Okay, because it's essentially isomorphic to that. Um, and that's what I've done in this diagram here, okay? Um, and another way you can think of it is that this set pi of x is really corresponding to the equalizer of our function which associates edges with source vertices and our function associating edges with target vertices. It basically corresponds with the set of edges which have the same source as target, as in the set of self loops. I, I don't know about you, but I think this is absolutely fascinating. I mean, the idea of, say, the set of self loops in a graph, that's the kind of idea that is easy to describe to someone visually. It's easy to explain to a kid, for example, what's a self loop in a directed network. You can just draw a few and they'll quickly get the idea. But what we're seeing here is that we're getting at these ideas computationally. We're getting at these I mean, it's one thing to sort of um, solve some differential equation numerically using a computer, but it's quite another thing to get at a really kind of rich concept, like the set of points in a network, um, and to get at that sort of automatically. I mean, this is one of the wonderful things about these kind of uh, limits and co-limits and on upwards to can extensions and so on. They literally 
reveal these um, concepts and you can see how these concepts are structured for things which you wouldn't expect to be computational. You'd expect them to be a more of a kind of matter of geometric intuition. So we're really kind of seeing the underlying structure of all of these ideas to do with space. And later we're going to see that by looking at co-limits instead, we'll get the idea of connectivity of graphs as we ex as we discussed earlier. But let's just stay with this idea of understanding this functor pi a bit more clearly um, in this case where we're looking at this category of graphs. Because it's really nice to see all of the ideas to do with this come out explicitly from the theory that we've discussed so far. Okay, so I know we've been talking about this case with the category of graphs, but if we just move again back to the general kind of case where we have some kind of category of structured sets set to the power of c. We're trying to understand this functor pi and I think we understand now how it works on objects. So pi of a functor x gives the apex of the limit cone of x. But um, that's not really the whole story because there's not just apexes of limit cones, there's whole limit cones involved in this kind of situation. So can we now understand how we get this kind of natural transformation phi such that pi of x comma phi is a terminal morphism from delta to x? Well, what we're going to see is that this is actually going to be giving us the kind of arrows of our limit cone. And I want to describe the nature of those. So um, you might already have guessed what kind of things they are. They're basically projections, okay, because we've got this thing here, pi of x, which is like this set of tuples. And then when we do delta on it, we get this constant functor, which sends everything in C to this apex of this limit cone. And then we want these kind of arrows coming down to our functor x okay so this is really the nature of the thing um i think it'll be easiest actually if i start by showing you how this works in this example we've already worked out for the category of graphs so um i know i said that pi of x is isomorphic to this but just for, forget about that temporarily let's think about pi of x in a more kind of complete way as this set of pairs of edges and vertices which have the property that um, the source and the target of the edge is the vertex, okay? So if we just sort of draw this out, then for this graph x over here, pi of x is going to be this set of triples, b comma 2, d comma 2, c comma three and then the kind of phi which makes this a limit cone the kind of natural transformation phi from delta of pi of x to x um, is just going to be doing projections basically so we have all these tuples here and there's a projection function sending those to these edges b d and c and they're going to be within our kind of edge set of X. So if it's going to be other things, there's also going to be A in here. But this first projection function goes like this. And that's going to be phi of E. And that goes from pi of X to X of E. And then there's also going to be this second projection function. which goes into this set of vertices x of v. And that's going to be phi of v. And together those two functions are like two components of this natural transformation phi, which goes from delta pi of x to x. And this is giving us our limit cone. Okay, so this is all, if you look at like, um, 
my video on limits and you think about like equalizers, this should all seem quite familiar, but let's formalize this in the kind of general case now. So um, here's our situation. We have a terminal morphism pi of x comma phi from delta to x. Um, and since we're thinking about sets, we have this kind of formula here describing the nature of this set, which constitutes the apex of the limit cone of x. And um, now we want to talk about the kind of natural transformation that's also sort of forming this limit cone. And um, it's pretty straightforward, really. Um, we know that for an object ci, we know that phi of ci is going to be a function from pi of x to x of ci. And the way it's actually going to work is that it's going to send one of these kind of tuples y to y of ci, the kind of component of that tuple um, which belongs to x of ci. So um, it's basically just a projection function. OK, so the kind of nature of the arrows of these limit cones um, in this uh, situation where we're dealing with structured sets is pretty simple. They're just projections. OK, OK, so the final thing to understand then about the real kind of core mechanics of limits of functors into sets is how to find these kind of intermediary arrows. So in particular, let's say we found our limit pi of x comma phi of this functor x and then we've got some kind of cone uh, w comma mu into x and we know that's just a candidate so we know there ought to be this intermediary arrow h which we can use to make this diagram commute so how do we find it how do we find this function h from the set w to the set pi of x our set of tuples well, it's pretty much the same way that it works for the categorical product. Um, I want to call this H. I don't want to call it H. I want to call it mu bar, okay, because it's really uniquely defined by mu. Okay, give me a candidate, I'll give you an intermediary arrow. I'll call it mu bar instead of H. So, given mu, how do we find this mu bar? Well, Basically, I'll just show you the, the way it works. Um, so here's our, so here's our candidate cone. Um, and so we've got this mu here, and that's a natural transformation from the functor that sends everything to W constantly to X. And given that mu, we can form this kind of intermediary arrow which um, is basically the h from the previous diagram and i'm calling that mu bar and it's going to be a function from this set w to this set of tuples pi of x and the way it basically works is if we imagine i mean you can do a similar thing in the case where c is infinite as well but if you imagine that the objects of this category c are c1 comma c2 all the way up to cn then um this function here is going to send an element W in this set, capital W, to this tuple here, which just has its kind of components equal to what we get by doing the corresponding um, component of mu on W. Okay, so this is the tuple mu of C1 of W, comma mu of C2 of W, all the way up to mu of cn of w and the critical thing here is that this resulting kind of element that i'm also calling r which is an element of pi of x has the feature that its ci component is just equal to what we get if we take w and then do mu of ci on this and this is clearly going to have the feature that when we do one of these projections on it one of these kind of uh, arrows of our actual limit cone, then we're going to be able to emulate the kind of corresponding component of this uh, mu, this kind of uh, candidate, this uh, pretender for being a limit cone mu.
So this basically tells us everything about how limits work in the category set. And we can use this to our advantage a lot for doing computations today. Okay, so we've looked deeply into how limits work for these functors from some category C into set. Uh, but we still really want to understand the full nature of this functor pi. We know that pi sends a object X in our category of structured sets to the apex of a limit cone of X. But how does it work on arrows? Well, we can see basically how this is set up uh, by this kind of picture here. So if we have an arrow alpha from X to X dash, what we want to do is do pi on alpha. We want to find out how that arrow between these structured sets gets lifted under pi. And we see that basically, uh, if we form this arrow alpha after phi, where here phi is involved in the limit cone of X, um, if we form alpha after phi, that's going to be a kind of cone of X dash. And if we compare that with the limit cone phi dash, then that will give us an intermediary arrow. And we could call that arrow alpha phi bar. Okay, so it's this kind of intermediary arrow, which allows us to kind of emulate the effect of alpha phi. Uh, in particular, if we do uh, delta on this arrow, we get something that completes this kind of triangle and makes it commute. Um, so we know basically how to take the bar of an arrow um, into X dash. So we know how to calculate alpha after phi bar. We know how to calculate this because this is what we were just discussing. And so in particular, um, we know that this phi of alpha, which is, so in particular then, we know that pi of alpha, which is alpha after phi bar, is just gonna be this function, which sends this element yc1, yc2, all the way up to ycn, that's an element of pi of x, this tuple. It just sends this to this tuple, alpha one of y of c one comma alpha two of y of c two all the way up to alpha m of y of c n. This is assuming that this category C just has these objects c one, c two, all the way up to c n. But the same idea basically would work even if uh, C had an infinite number of objects. And you can see that this is very similar to some familiar ways that, um, for example, we can times together two arrows when we're thinking about products and things like that. And it really gives us a kind of natural way to convert from the limit cone of X to the limit cone of X dash using an arrow alpha. And it really gives us a way to use a natural transformation alpha from X to X dash to convert from a limit cone of X to a limit cone of X dash. So, okay, now that we have this kind of general prescription of how to apply pi to an arrow alpha from a structured set X to a structured set X dash, let's um, have a look at this uh, case with the category of graphs again. Okay, so now we're thinking about this case where C is our category of two parallel arrows and if we have this graph here, and then we've got this uh, kind of graph morphism alpha from this graph X to this graph X dash, then it's pretty sort of um, self-explanatory how pi works when we do pi on this arrow. So of course it's going to go from pi of X to pi of X dash. And so it's going to go from the kind of set of self loops of X to the set of self loops of X dash. And we'd see indeed using this kind of uh, description up here that um, pi of alpha um, is just going to send a pair, for example, d comma two to um, the things we get by operating alpha on those elements from that pair. So in particular, we're going to have the pi of alpha of d comma two is going to be alpha e of d 
comma alpha v of 2, which is indeed a dash comma 1 dash. And so there we have it. Now we understand uh, properly all about this functor pi, which is the right adjoint of our diagonal functor delta, at least in the case where we're thinking about functors going into this category set. So one thing I like here is that once you get comfortable with this kind of language of limits, this actually gives us a really kind of clear way of thinking about what, for example, this functor pi is doing. It gives us a kind of uniform language to describe it in, which is sort of naturally connected with so many other ideas uh, via this kind of theory of adjoint functors. Okay, so, so far we've already discussed this diagonal functor and its right adjoint pi, which gives limits. So now we want to understand the left adjoint of this diagonal functor, this functor sigma, which gives co-limits. And we're interested in this case where A is set. So we're interested in basically what's the co-limit of a object in a category of structured sets. And so it's basically this idea of what's a co-limit of a functor into set. And so um, this is again a question which can be answered in totality. Uh, so let's do it. Um, so firstly, we're going to need a bit of notation. So say if we have a load of indexed sets, for example, S1, S2, S3, if these are sets, then we can write this, which is like the sum of sets. And it really just means the co-product S1 plus S2 plus S3 in the category set. And we, or we can think of it as a kind of discriminated union where we kind of um, take these sets and then we append a kind of label onto the elements of them and then we take the union of all of those. Or we can even describe it more directly to say that it's the set of all y comma i, where y belongs to the set si for some i in one, two, three. Uh, and so this is the kind of notation we are going to use. Again, I'm putting a little tilde upstairs here just to differentiate this from the other sigma I'm using, which is denoting a functor. So basically when I write sigma tilde, um, we're going to be adding sets. We're going to be adding indexed sets. So that's this kind of notation. And we're going to use this now as we describe how this functor sigma works on objects. So in particular, we're going to think that we have a functor X from some category C to set. And we're interested in computing sigma of X. And we know that that's going to be the apex of the co-limits cone of X. But how do we work out co-limits of functors into sets? How do we work out this co-limit of this functor X? Well, like we did with limits, we start by thinking about the apex. So we really have a pretty direct description of how to work out this uh, apex of this co-limit co-cone of X. And um, this description, uh, I'm going to go over the kind of usual way people describe it first, and then I'm going to um, talk about my kind of preferred way of thinking about it, which I personally find a bit simpler. And then we're going to look at an example. So this might seem a bit, um, a bit peculiar at first pass, but we'll get to understand it properly. Let's go through uh, how this works. In particular, the apex of this co-limit co-cone of this functor X is going to be a set, and this is um, how we write it, okay? So there's a lot going on here. So firstly, this thing here is basically just the co-product of X of CI for every object CI in the category C. Okay, so we're literally just sort of forming the discriminated union or the disjoint union of 
all of the kind of objects in this diagram. Um, but then we have sort of this thing, which is like loads of sets added together. And then we want to kind of cut it down a bit by gluing together uh, certain elements. And so what this notation means is that we have the quotient set of this sum here by this equivalence relation, which I'm denoting as squiggle squiggle. And here, squiggle squiggle is the minimal equivalence relation on uh, this set here, which has the property that for every arrow F of our category C, and for every element Y of X of C I, we have the y comma c i is in this equivalent relation squiggle squiggle with x of f of y comma c j. Now that sounds pretty complicated, um, but it's actually it's actually surprising how how intuitive this concept is. Okay, um, so let me just give a sort of two minute sketch, which I think will hopefully be a bit clearer. So we've got this functor X into set, right? So um, we're going to have some sets X of C1. And if there's another object C2 in our category C, we'll have another set X of C2. And then maybe there's a function F in our category C from C1 to C. Sorry, maybe there's an arrow F in our category C from C1 to C2, so that's going to become some kind of a function uh, X of F like this. Maybe there's also uh, something else going on. Maybe there's also a cat, uh, object C3 and arrow G, and this is our category C. And then this is going to be a set X of C3 and it's going to have elements like this. And so basically all we do is firstly, we sort of form the uh, disjoint union of these sets. So we can kind of go like this. Uh, that's from X of C1. This is from X of C2. And this is from X of C3. And we kind of merge all these together into a big set. So this is a sum. But then all we do is we join together or we merge elements which are connected by these kind of uh, arrows that we've drawn in here, which represent how individual elements get mapped. So this is going to be X of G, okay? So in particular, since this element here um, gets mapped to this element, in particular, since this element here gets mapped to this element here, um, we want to be merging these two things. And since this one here got us mapped to this one here, we want to be merging these two things. And uh, similarly, we have these kind of strings like this and like this. So we want to be merging this and this and so we literally just regard these things which are connected by these kind of uh, wires showing how our functions work in our diagram of our functor we just um, literally identify those we just glue them together okay so um, basically after we've um, quotiented out by this equivalent relation uh, all of this stuff's going to get merged and that's just going to become one thing. And uh, all of this stuff's going to get merged because these are the connected components of a kind of graph that we're forming. And so we're actually just going to end up with sort of uh, four different things. Um, this connected component, that's one, that's two, that's three, and that's four. Okay, four different things when we sort of merge stuff 
that gets mapped to each other. And this is basically all we're doing, okay? Um, so kind of pictorially, it's a lot easier to understand, I think. Um, and here's my preferred way to think of it. Um, we have this kind of disjoint union of all of the kind of uh, sets within our diagram that we want to take a co-limit of. And um, we can basically, and we can basically form a graph with this. Okay, so we can think of this as the vertex set of a graph. And then a vertex might be look, and then a vertex might look like this. It'll be a pair y comma ci, where y is an element from x of ci. And we want to link such a vertex to another vertex, say z comma cj, precisely when there's an arrow f in our category c, such that if we lift that arrow f under x and operate that function x of f on y, we get z. So this allows us to define a graph. And then we just um, think about this thing here as just the set of connected components, the set of weakly connected components of that graph. Um, and that also gives us a kind of function. Um, so uh, in particular, if we have a vertex of our graph, or if, if you like, if we have an element in this sum, then um, we can wrap that in square brackets and that denotes the connected component of our graph that that vertex lies in. And this gives us this kind of uh, map here from elements of our sum to uh, elements of this set sigma x. Or if you like to think of this in the language of equivalence relations, you could say that this um, kind of square bracket uh, function here uh, sends an element in this sum here to the equivalence class that that relation belongs to under this kind of equivalence relation squiggle squiggle that I discussed before. Okay, so I'll give an example of how to actually work out these co-limits in a moment, but I thought since I've described how to find the apex of a co-limit cone of x, I should also describe how the sort of natural transformation or arrows involved in this co-limit are described. So in particular, if this um, natural transformation phi from x to delta of sigma of x, if this is um, forming this co-limit co-cone, then what are the components of this going to be like? Well, if we have an object ci of our category c, then there's going to be a ci component of phi, phi subscript c of i. And that's going to be a function which goes from x of c of i to this kind of sigma of x. And so if we have an element y in x of c of i, then this function is going to map it to the equivalence class that y comma ci belongs to. All right, so basically, if we have this y here, if we clip a ci onto the end of it, we can think of it uh, in as something belonging to our sum set, or if you like, belonging to the vertex set of that graph g that we formed. And then if we just look at the connected component that that vertex belongs to by sort of wrapping it in square brackets, if you like, uh, that's going to be an element in this kind of set sigma x of connected components of G. Um, and that does the job for us. Okay, so let's put our newfound understanding of how co-limits work in set into practice. So we're going to find the apex of the co-limit co-cone associated with this graph. So now, of course, we're thinking of this graph as a functor x from the category C to set, where C is our category with two parallel arrows. So uh, basically, we can visualize this functor uh, like this, okay? Um, it involves this set x of E and this set x of V, and this function which associates every edge with a source and this function 
in red that associates every edge with a target. And so now we just follow the steps which we've already described. So the first thing we want to do is to do the disjoint union of all of the kind of um, objects involved in this diagram. So we want to calculate x of e plus x of v. And that gives this set here. And then all we want to do is to just um, sort of glue together things which have a kind of function mapping between them. So there's two functions involved here, x of s and x of t. And so if we just connect everything uh, to sort of where it gets mapped under x of s, And now we connect everything to where it gets mapped under x of t. Then what we can do is identify things which are now linked in this graph. And that's what gives us this, um, this other graph here. So there's, so there's two different connected components here, and we'll call one of them m and one of them n. So we now have this set here of two connected components. And this is the set of weakly connected components of the graph that we just talked about. And there's also this kind of function which uh, maps each of these vertices of this graph we've formed um, to the connected components it has. So these are both in N and these three are in connected component M. And this is really this kind of, we can think of it as something like a function that sends um, every element in this kind of sum set to uh, the kind of equivalence class that it um, that it's in under this equivalence relation, squiggle, squiggle. Um, anyway, we can also now use our kind of method Anyway, we can also actually not just compute this set of M and N, which is really the um, apex of the co-limit cone of X. We can also calculate the actual kind of natural transformation, which forms this limit co-cone. So this is a natural transformation and it has two components, um, one of them working on the edges and the other one working on the vertices. And so this is gonna send A, well, A gets sent it gets injected to become a comma e and then it gets sent to this equivalence class m so this um co-limit co-cone component uh phi of e sends a to m whereas b gets sent to m and also um phi of v is going to send 1 to m and 2 to m and 3 to n. So this is going to be phi of v. So there we have it. This is all the information. This is really a description of our co-limit co-cone. And really, uh, it just sort of boils down to saying, well, there's two different connected components of this graph. This one we'll call m and this one we'll call n. And then it just sort of records uh, what's in the different connected components. But I think it's just absolutely fascinating that all of this information is kind of given to us by this sort of like mechanical theory of co-limits. OK, so I've already discussed at some length how this uh, left adjoint sigma of um, this diagonal functor delta works on objects. Um, but the final thing to say about this, and then I'll change topic, is um, how does this functor sigma work on arrows? And in a way, we've already kind of figured this out. So um, basically the key is in this sort of picture here. The idea basically is that if we have an arrow alpha from x to x dash, well, we want to work out sigma of alpha, and that's going to be the sort of 
intermediary arrow um, associated with phi dash after alpha. So it's really what we could call phi dash after alpha bar. And so we've already discussed this kind of idea. And so we've already discussed this kind of idea. And so basically, I'll just say the result um, is that um, this sort of lifted arrow, this thing that we could call sigma of alpha, it's going to be a function from sigma of x to sigma of x dash. And the way it works is that if we're operating on an element k of sigma of x, what we can do is we can find any kind of um, y comma cj within our kind of sum set that basically is like a vertex of that graph, which um, belongs to the kind of connected component k, if you like, or it has the property that if we do this uh, square brackets, finding the equivalence class operation on y comma cj, we get k. So if we get any kind of y comma cj like that, well, that's going to be um, something in this kind of uh, sum of sets here. And the thing is then that if we do alpha, and the thing is then that if we do um, the cj component of alpha on that y, and then we append a cj onto that, that's going to give us something which is in the kind of um, sum of sets. Um, it's going to be in this set here. X, I, N, C, sum, X dash of C, I. Um, and then if that's what this thing's going to be in the sets. So this is going to be the set which holds this. And then if we kind of find the equivalence class that that belongs to, um, then that's going to be our resulting element of uh, sigma of x dash. And basically, this is how the kind of scenario works in general. What this corresponds to, um, if we're thinking about graphs, well, alpha would be a kind of graph morphism from one graph to another. And then basically what this will boil down to is if you want to find out what happens to a particular connected component, find a vertex in that connected component, find where it gets mapped and find which connected component that is. And that'll tell you how connected components get mapped to one another because um, the sort of graph morphisms always have to preserve connectivity. So I think all this stuff is just fascinating because we're really getting a kind of general theory of connectivity. I mean, it's, um, you know, it, it seems like more general than a lot of the stuff that people talk about in topology because like there's just so many different kinds of examples that we can apply this kind of theory to. And the fact that we can generalize things much, much further is truly remarkable. Um, so yeah. Okay, so now we've got some general understanding of not only this diagonal functor from set to this category of structured sets, but also we know about what its right adjoint is going to be like, which makes limits, and what this left adjoint is going to be like, which gives co-limits. And so as we go through this video, we're going to encounter lots of different categories set to the power of C for different categories C. And these are going to correspond to lots of different kinds of structured sets. So we have focused on graphs a lot so far, but we're also going to see things like uh, dynamical systems and simplicial sets and functions, all basically um, being described as objects within a category set to the power of C for a particular category C. And I also promised that there would be some connection with dependent type theory. Now, um, I'm really reluctant to add much dependent type theory into this video simply because there's already like so many different prerequisites and I don't want to make a video that um, almost nobody can follow. So I'm actually going to um, only say a little bit about this connection with dependent type theory, but I'll um, put a link to uh, my video on dependent type theory where you can see this connection more clearly. So here's the basic idea anyway. 
uh, let's say we have a set A. Now, if we have a set A, then let's write A in double square brackets to denote the sort of discrete category that we get uh, using set A. So the idea is that we form this category that has A as its object set, and it has as few arrows as possible. It only has identity arrows. So this is the sort of category which is basically as close to the set A as we can get. Now, um, here's an interesting thing then. Um, now, here's an interest, now, here's the kind of interesting idea. Why don't we look at this situation, which we've already been studying, where our category C that we use is actually this A double arrow thing for some set A. So in other words, we're thinking about set to the power of a discrete category. And then we're interested in questions like, what is this diagonal functor delta? And what are these uh, left and right adjoints of that? And those are all questions that can be answered. And the answers have a lot to do with dependent type theory. So I suppose the first question is, how are we to think of this category set to the power of A? Well, basically, um, what we can we can think it, that the objects of this category are going to be functors from this kind of discretization of A to set. Um, but what that really means is just that each of these kind of objects in this category is just going to get sent to a set. And that's pretty much all that happens because there are no non-trivial arrows. And so really a functor X from this A to set, we can think of it really as just a sort of triple of sets or maybe a bit more enlightening or, may, or maybe it's a bit more enlightening to say, well, it's a kind of variable set, which is sort of indexed by an element of the set A. So we can think that it's really this kind of, it's these three sets, X of A1 and X of A2 and X of A3. And so this is really interesting because it is very, very similar to the idea of a dependent type. You see in dependent type theory, you basically have these things called types, which um, from our naive perspective at the moment, we'll think of as sets, although types can be more general. But anyway, for now, let's just pretend that um, dependent type theory is just talking about sets. So basically the idea is that you can have dependent types where the sort of nature of the type depends upon some other value. And in a similar way, we can think of this as a sort of, um, it's like a set, but the nature of that set depends on which elements of A we're thinking of. Okay. Um, and so all of the sort of triples of sets form all the sort of objects of this category set to the power of A box. And so in a way we could think of this first sort of set in here as like the fiber over A1, and this could be the fiber over A2, and this could be the fiber over A3. We can think of that as just some new terminology, and then really an arrow between, and then really an arrow from one of these kind of triples of sets to another one, in other words, an arrow of set to the power of a box is just going to be a sort of triple of functions, which are like the first function goes from the first fiber of, of our source object to the first art, to the first fiber of our target object. And then the second function maps between the second fibers and the third function maps between the third fibers. And such a thing would constitute an arrow from one kind of object like this in here to another. And all of this matches up really well with what's going on in dependent type theory. And moreover, if we then work out what the kind of left adjoint is to this sort of thing, basically what the left adjoint does 
I mean, this is very rough and ready, but basically it merges these fibers together. Okay, so it takes a kind of um, triple of sets like this, and then it just kind of does the discriminated union of these kind of three sets. So it would end up forming something like this. So if this was X, then Sigma X would look like this. And that's basically why I chose to use Sigma. Um, now, of course, this is a discriminated union. So there would be some extra kind of things. In fact, we'd be indexing these elements, like the things from the things that came from the first fiber would get tagged with an A1 and so on. Um, and also, how does this pi functor work? Well, how this pi functor works basically is it sends this kind of X here to um, the set of all kind of sections of this. So a section of it, essentially, sections actually usually used in a different kind of context, but let's just say a section of this is where we pick one element from each of these fibers. And so there's a whole set of different sections that we can do of this X and that kind of set of sections is basically pi of x. Um, and, and so it's remarkable that all of this kind of theory, which basically corresponds with the sort of theory of uh, sigma types and pi types, independent type theory, we can think of it really as coming about from this theory of um, left and right adjoints of the diagonal functor, uh, just in this very, very special case. Um, incidentally, I should describe what this diagonal functor actually does. So that's quite straightforward as well. So if we have a set like, let's say this one, B1, B2, so that's our set B, then when we do this diagonal functor on it, that's going to make this triple of sets. So it's going to be uh, just basically three copies of that. So this is going to be what happens when we do our diagonal functor on B. So I know I've been a bit kind of vague here, but the thing is I've already really described this sort of more general situation. And so if you just look at how I've described this, for the scenario where C is this kind of discrete category, then you can understand the nature of delta, pi, and sigma. And that should hopefully shed a lot of light on the kind of theory of dependent types, in particular, um, this idea of sort of what dependent types are and how these kind of sigma types and pi types work. But there's another view of this as well, which I wanted to point out, because there's another very interesting connection. Um, now, the thing is that I said A is a set. So another thing we can do is we can consider the slice category. So that's written set slice A. And basically, the idea here is that we're forming a new category. Um, and then the objects of that category, like here, are going to be arrows in set that go into A. So basically any function that goes into the set A is now considered to be an object of this slice category. And then what's, what constitutes an arrow from let's say one object to another? So an arrow K from this object F to this object G within our slice category basically just corresponds in our original category in set to this arrow K from the source of F to the source of G, which is such that G after K equals F. So basically we can think of this slice category as having objects which are functions into A. And then the thing is though, that there's a very, very, very interesting correspondence, which is this one here, um, which is that set to the power of A box, that category is isomorphic to this slice category. And it's very nice to see what, why this works. So if we consider a function F, let's say from B to A, 
Well, um, if we just look at, let's say, an element A2 of A, and we ask ourselves, what are all the things that got sent to A2 under F? Well, that defines for us a set. And you see there are three kind of sets defined as pre-images like this. And so we can really think of a function F into set A as a kind of collection of sets, the kind of pre-images of all of the things in A. Um, and so in a way, it's kind of like a A indexed collection of sets, in this case, a triple. So this set here, this set here, and this set here. And that's corresponding with an object of set to the power of A box. And also the kind of arrows in set to the power of A box. So these, they're these kind of fiber preserving mappings. And they're basically just the same kind of thing as these kind of things like K, which work well with the structure of these, which work well with the structure of these kind of functions. So for example, if we have some element AI in our set A, then we might have some B belonging to F to the minus one of AI. That's the set of elements that F sends to BI. And then we'd also then want um, K of B to belong to G to the minus one of AI, because we want to have the feature that if we do uh, G on K of B, we get F of B, which is AI. So this is pretty interesting as well, because we have this sort of relationship, which I've been saying has to do with dependent type theory. And what we can then do is we can say, okay, well, that's actually isomorphic to set slice A. And then basically we can and then basically we can kind of put this isomorphism on the end of these functors. So we can then have a kind of uh, extra long diagonal functor and a kind of extended left adjoint to that, which we could call sigma dash and an extended kind of right adjoint to that. So these are just composing the functors which were originally there with this isomorphism. So these are also going to be a triple of kind of functors that are related by adjunctions as well. So in particular, sigma dash will be the left adjoint of delta dash and pi dash will be the right adjoint of delta dash. And actually these functors that I've now drawn in, um, these are sort of well known as well as another kind of triple of functors which come into the theory of slice categories. And they're something which I discuss in my video on dependent type theory. Um, so it's basically, there's like so many ideas which are all very, very similar. And also um, this idea of sigma types and pi types has to do with logic as well. Okay, because things are all very closely connected. I don't want to um, sort of diverge too much from what I was saying, but I'll just say very briefly that um, these sigma types have to do with this kind of existential quantifier and these pi types have to do with this kind of universal quantifier. Um, so you can see more about that if you check out my videos on dependent type theory. And um, it's really very pleasing how all these ideas are so intertwined, uh, but it really seems as though uh, adjoint functors or maybe more uh, powerfully can extensions are sort of behind so many different things that are going on in pure mathematics. Okay then, so now we've had this big discussion about limits and colimits, we're finally ready to talk about can extensions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to think about a kind of functor which goes between functor categories. So in particular, I'd like us to think about three different categories. Let's call them A, C, and M. And for now, uh, these can be any categories. We might want to think of this category A as being set, but we don't have to. But the thing is, we're going to suppose that we have a, 
any functor k from m to c. And now using that functor, we can form another functor, which we call a to the power of k. And sometimes I'll call it the precomposition functor using k. And this basically is going to be a functor from this functor category, a to the power of c, to this functor category, a to the power of m. Now, when we write functor categories, we write them using this kind of exponential notation. And that's not a coincidence. Now, a category is an object of this category cat. And in fact, a functor category is a exponential object in the category cat. And also, in general, in the theory of exponential objects, as I discuss in my video, Category Theory for Beginners Exponential Objects, it is possible to take an object and raise it to the power of an arrow. And that gives you an arrow like this that can go from one exponential object to another. So it is possible to think about this arrow a to the power of k using the ideas I discussed in my video on exponential objects. But I want to sort of minimize um, the number of prerequisites for this video. So I'll just directly explain to you how this uh, functor a to the power of k works. And it's quite telling that it's called the precomposition functor. You see, if we have an object of a to the power of c, that's really going to be a functor x from c to a. And if we just take that x and then we precompose it with k, that resultant composition, x after k, that's going to be a functor from m to a, and therefore can be thought of an object of this functor category here. So now you can understand how this functor a to the power of k works on objects. It takes in an object and then it composes the functor k before that object it's working on, before that functor is working on. And that makes a sort of functor that goes all the way from m to a. And so this is really quite remarkable. As we're going to see shortly, this um, allows us to translate from different functor categories. And if you think about structured sets, it often allows you to sort of translate data from one kind of structure to another. So for example, well, we'll discuss this shortly, but um, a dynamical system, uh, if you have say a function from a set to itself, let's say you send one to two and two to one and three to two, so then you might want to draw your dynamical system like this. And these will be the update arrows. But look what we've drawn here. We've drawn a graph. So it turns out that there's a way to translate from a dynamical system to a graph. And it gives you the sort of graph representing a dynamical system. And this is doable by using um, this kind of setup where A is set. We'll talk about this momentarily. So these functor categories are really important for lots of reasons. Um, but before I talk more about that, I just want to say, um, just to finish defining how a to the power of k actually works. So we've talked about how it works on objects. The other thing to say is how it works on arrows. So let's say we have an arrow alpha from x to y in a to the power of c. Well, that really means we have a sort of natural transformation alpha from a functor x to a functor y. And what happens to this arrow? How does it get lifted when we apply this functor a to the power of k? Well, it turns out that this thing here is the result. This is a to the power of k of alpha. Now, there are a couple of ways to describe this. If you know a bit about natural transformations, we could say that this is the horizontal composition alpha after the identity of the functor k. 
So we could sort of represent this by this sort of diagram like this, involving whiskering. So if, if we want to be sophisticated, we can think of this solid dot here, at least for this video, is going to denote horizontal composition of natural transformations. And we can think about this in those terms. Or we can just think of this as the kind of name of the thing. And um, we'll actually describe exactly how it works directly here. So we're saying that really um, this result of applying a to the power of k to alpha, um, it's a natural transformation and it's mth component for an object m of our category bold m. The mth component of this natural transformation here is just going to be alpha of km. Okay, because k is a functor from m to c. And so if we pick some object ordinary m in here, um, if we do k on it, that will give us an object of c. And there's going to be a component uh, alpha of km. And that's going to be an arrow from x of km to y of km. And that's the kind of thing we want. So this gives us our kind of natural transformation, which is going to be a natural transformation from x after k to y after k. And this makes sense because x after k is going to be a to the power of k of x and y after k is going to be a to the power of k of y. So that's it. That's how this functor works. Let me just summarize it because I don't want this to get confusing. So we have to say how it works on objects and arrows. So for an object x of this functor category a to the power of c, in other words, for a functor x from c to a, we have that this functor a to the power of k sends that x to x after k. And also for an arrow alpha from x to y in a to the power of c, in other words, from a for a natural transformation alpha from x to y, we have that a to the power of k sends that alpha to this horizontal composition alpha dot identity of k. And we can really just think of this, if we like, simply as notation um, for this natural transformation, um, which for an object M of the category bold M has an Mth component equal to alpha of K M. So, okay, this is the definition. So why are we interested in this? Well, uh, one main reason is that it's a very interesting way of like translating between categories of structured sets in this special case where A is set. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. The other reason is because we can talk about can extensions now. Now, um, I'm going to get into the specifics of can extensions very, very shortly, but um, I'll just say that essentially, I mean, this is not completely true, but it's um, it's close to being true. Um, the There's two can extensions, and really we can think of the right can extension as corresponding with the sort of right adjoint of this functor. And we can think of the left can extension as corresponding with the left adjoint of this functor. In other words, if we can work out the right and left adjoints to this functor, that's really the same thing as working out the can extensions, the left and right can extensions. And so this is really the thing that we're interested in doing. And we're also going to very shortly see that what we've done so far can be viewed in these kind of terms as well. Okay, so for most of the rest of the video, we're going to be considering a functor from one category to another. And we're going to be interested in this kind of functor, a to the power of k, often in the case where 
A is set. And these are already very, very interesting things because they give us often rather natural ways to convert between functal categories, like these categories of structured sets. Um, but we're also going to be interested in determining the left and right adjoints of functors like this. And that's again because those kind of functors tend to tell us an enormous amount about these different kinds of spaces and how they are related to each other. Now to motivate this, I wanted to go through a few examples. Now, if you take some small category C and you consider a set to the power of C, that's going to give you a category of structured sets. And in general, whenever you have some functor from a category M to a category C, set to the power of K always gives us this sort of way to convert between these different kinds of categories. And so basically any sort of functor between two small categories, you can kind of take that functor K and do set to the power of it. And that's going to give you a way to convert between functor categories. And these things are of special interest, especially if you've looked at um, topos theory or um, categories of presheaves. Well, these are basically, these categories of structured sets are basically just categories of presheaves in disguise. Um, and the thing is that all of these things are toposes as well. So for example, the category of graphs, the category of dynamical systems, and so on. These are all, um, these are all toposes, they have lots of nice properties, and it's in this kind of manner, using like sec to the power of k, um, that we can translate between them. Of course, there are other functors, other ways to translate between these kinds of categories as well, but often, doing set to the power of k gives a very natural sort of way to convert from one functor category to another. And one of the reasons for this is that there's always going to be left and right adjoints to uh, a functor like set to the power of k. And so regarding structured sets, a situation which we're often going to be considering is when we have a functor k from some category m to some category c, and then that's going to give us this functor set to the power of k from set to the power of c to set to the power of m. And then we're going to be interested in determining the left and the right adjoints to that functor. And this is one of the main things we're going to be using can extensions to do. Now, it turns out that because of the nice properties of sets, in particular, the fact that it's bi-complete, we can work out these can extensions and therefore we can work out the left and right adjoints to set to the power of K. And so basically there's all these different situations in, in um, mathematics where we have a functor K from some small category M to some small category C. And in every one of these situations, can extensions give us two other functors, which are usually on a sort of level of conceptual importance, similar to that of set to the power of K. So if the functor K you choose is interesting, then you kind of get two extra functors for free, which will also be interesting. And I think this teaches us so much about different ways that spaces relate to each other. Hopefully I can convey that a bit. So um, I'll just highlight just a few examples. Of course, there are so many different functors in category theory. I mean, it's almost a ludicrous statement because there's just so many and um, you can come up with so many. So um, I'll put a link in the description to a video um, by I think it's a channel called Maths Proofable, um, where he talks about uh, topos theory. And there's that video, there's like three very short videos where he very succinctly describes these kind of uh, categories of structured sets. And it's such a nice, quick introduction where you see that there's like so many different kinds of um, 
categories of structured sets and you can then think about all the kind of or think about many different functors between them how those give um manners of converting between these categories of structured sets and then you know if you're interested you can pick up these tools about can extensions that we're sort of um discussing today and you can apply those to find these extra functors and i almost guarantee you you'll find things which are really remarkable maybe even like really relevant undiscovered functors um so anyway um let's just go through some examples then to motivate all this so here's one of my first ones that i really like um maybe i should just say something very briefly about the category of dynamical systems so um this there's a certain category i sometimes abbreviate it like this but i really mean it's the sort of free monoid with one generator if you like so it has a single object it has an identity arrow there's also another arrow called sigma and there's all the kind of iterates of sigma so there's sigma after sigma uh, sigma after sigma after sigma which you could call sigma cubed sigma to the power of four and so on um, so these are all the arrows um, and the sort of way that composition works is that sigma m after sigma n equals sigma m plus n and we can regard the identity arrow as sigma to the power of zero so this is the sort of um, free monoid on one generator also known as the additive monoid of natural numbers and i usually just like to note it like that so um, a functor from this category to set it would send this single object here to a set let's say this one here of elements one two and three and um it would send this arrow sigma this endomorphism as they like to say um although that language seems a little bit overblown but anyway um that gets sent to a mapping from this set to itself so let's send one to two two to one and three to two so if this functor is called x then this here would be x of sigma and let's call this object star and then we've got x of star here and x of star here and this is uh, what we like to call a dynamical system uh, because we can imagine repeatedly applying this function from the set to itself and we can imagine that's causing the kind of state of the system to change so if it's in state one now it'll be in state two the next time step be in state one the time step after that and so on so as you probably know we can visualize dynamical systems as graphs but one of the interesting things i think is that we can really make it very explicit how that works um, by considering this functor k so this is so this is a functor uh, from our sort of index category for making graphs to our sort of index category for making dynamical systems and it sends this kind of source arrow to the identity and this target arrow to our kind of update arrow sigma and the thing is then if we have this as our functor k then if we consider set to the power of k that's going to be a functor from our category of dynamical systems to our category of graphs and it's actually going to send a dynamical system to the kind of graph of that dynamical system so here's a kind of illustration of how this works um, so we have this uh, functor x in fact it's really the functor i just talked about um so this is our, our dynamical system really or we could say a bit more um, long-windedly it's a 
funked or from the additive monoid of natural numbers to the category set. But anyway, um, here it is. And the thing is, though, if we then sort of do set to the power of k on this object x of our category of dynamical systems, um, the result is going to be x after k. And if you think about that, that's going to send s to this kind of identity function, and it's going to send t to this kind of update function. And therefore, we're going to have, and also uh, v and e are both going to get sent to x of star. And therefore, we're going to have a graph that has a vertex set e and an edge set equal to the set of states of our dynamical system. And the source of an edge is going to be itself and the target of an edge is going to be the result of updating the corresponding state in the dynamical system and therefore this sort of automatically gives us this kind of graphical uh, way of visualizing a dynamical system and I, I think this is just lovely because it's like um, it's like being able to bite your own teeth or something you can really kind of uh, explicitly see um, where the kind of, you know, this idea of, oh, you can draw a picture of that dynamical system seems like it's too simple to actually get at. Um, it's like too elementary, but we see it isn't. We see we can make all these things explicit, um, which I think is really great. So yeah, it can be very interesting to consider things like this, uh, but also if you can imagine, when we work out the left and right adjoints of this sort of functor, we get things which are of a roughly kind of similar level of importance. And so we also get really fascinating functors going in the other direction by considering left and right adjoints. And what are those functors? And how do they teach us about dynamical systems and graphs? Well, they teach us quite a bit, actually. Um, and then here's another example. So this is a bit different, but here we have this category. I've chosen again, this one that makes the, the uh, categories of dynamical systems, this additive monoid of natural numbers. And what we're doing now is we're sort of having a point of this category, if you like. We're thinking of K as a point of this category. Um, in particular, um, functors have to preserve identity arrows. So what we're doing with this K here is we're picking one of the objects in this category on the right. Actually, there's only one to choose from, but you know, that's basically what we're doing. And then we're sending the terminal object of cat, this uh, single object, single arrow category. We're sending this into this category on the right here. And so we're sending we're using K to send the identity arrow of star to the identity arrow of this kind of object, which is this object in our additive monoid of natural numbers. So, okay, uh, what happens when we do set to the power of K for this functor K? Well, we get this kind of functor here. It goes from a dynamical system to um, an object in set to the power of one. So what's set to the power of one? Okay, basically this looks like set. Okay, maybe I can try and quickly convince you of that. I'll try and do it more generally. So more generally, if we think about the category A to the power of one, what are the objects of that category? Well, an object of this category is going to be a functor from one to a so maybe like a functor f but this is just going to be this category of a single object and the identity arrow and if you think about what a um, functor f is doing from something like that to um, this category a essentially it's just picking out an object F in our category A. And so you can really think about um, the kind of 
you can really think about an arrow that comes from one. So you can really think about an arrow that comes from the terminal object in cat as picking out a single object in its target category. And this is pretty much exactly analogous to the way things work in set, where an arrow from the terminal object picks out an element in a set. And that's kind of why you can think of um, a to the power of one has been isomorphic to a. And if you want to be more precise, you could say, well, I'll map every functor like this one f from one to a to its target object. And I'll map the kind of natural transformations between such functors to the sort of only component that those natural transformations have. And that'll give you your sort of formal, um, well, at least this direction of the isomorphism. So the long and short of it is that we can really think of set to the power of K as going from our category of dynamical systems to our category set in this case. And the way it works is really quite simple. All it does in this case is it just sends a dynamical system to its set of states. Okay, so this is kind of like a forgetful functor. Um, it just forgets a lot of the information. And there are similar ones like this. Um, in fact, if you just replace this category on the right with some other category, like say a category of graphs, you can make a functor which, for example, sends a graph to its vertex set um, in a very similar kind of manner. And, um, <clears throat> and um, I mean, as I point these out, you should notice that like the reason I'm pointing all of these things out is because all of these functors I'm discussing have left and right adjoints. And that's kind of why it's interesting to talk about these because I'm sort of pointing at lots of places where there's like extra exploration, which can be done. Um, so here's yet another example. Um, and this is also very interesting. So on the left here, we've got this category M, which is our category that makes graphs, our category of two parallel arrows. And what we're doing here um, is we're considering this functor um, K equals exclamation mark M, which is the unique functor from M to our terminal object. So it's basically the functor that just collapses all of the arrows in M into the identity arrow of uh, star within this terminal object. And so here's another functor k. And once again, if we consider set to the power of k, then this is going to be a functor which, then this is going to be a functor which basically uh, takes a set and sort of makes the graph with um, loops as that set. So we've actually seen this one before. So if we consider, for example, a set one, two, and three, if we do this functor on it, so if we do set to the power of K on this uh, set here, then the result is going to be just this graph, which has each of these elements becoming self loops So it's really forming this kind of discrete graph, okay? Um, so we've already really talked about this before. And in fact, it's nothing more than the diagonal functor that we've already been discussing, okay? So this is really quite remarkable. Um, so, and it doesn't just work for graphs, this works more generally as well. So if we now go sort of zoom out a bit, and instead of using sets, we'll just write a general category A, then we have this kind of situation in general, okay? Um, if we have any category M, then <clears throat> if we have any category M, then there's going to be a unique arrow from M to the terminal object in cat. And then if we do uh, A to the power of that unique arrow, that gives us this functor, which, um, 
And then if we do a to the power of that unique arrow, we get this functor, which goes from a to the power of one to a to the power of m. And if we compose with this isomorphism here, I mean, essentially we can just think what's going on is that we really just have this diagonal functor. Okay, so basically, um, if we can work out the left and right adjoints of this functor that I've circled, uh, which we can using or can extensions, um, at least when A is well behaved as set is, then um, essentially we can solve this original problem, um, which is this problem that we were considering, which is the problem of finding the left and right adjoints of this diagonal functor delta, because up to isomorphism, um, this set to the power of exclamation mark m, it basically looks like delta. It basically is this diagonal functor. Um, so this is great. This is really great because um, all of the things that we've talked about so far then, about working out the left and right adjoints of um, this diagonal functor, basically can be considered to be special cases of this new problem that we're going to be considering, this kind of general problem. So so let me tell you the general problem then. Um, okay, this is almost the general problem. Almost the general problem is this one here, that we have some functor from some category M to some category C, then we form these categories of structured sets, and we know how set to the power of K works, and we're interested in determining the left and right adjoints of that functor. But we can make this slightly more general, and we can consider some general category A here instead of necessarily set. And this is as general as we get. And this is really what can extensions are about. They're about working out the left and right adjoints of A to the power of K. Now, um, there might be some seasoned category theorists kind of wincing at this point because um, that's not exactly how can extensions work and they're a tiny bit more general than just to do with adjoint functors uh, but we're going to get into those details very shortly we have this functor k from m to c and so we have this functor a to the power of k which goes from a to the power of c to a to the power of m and we've already looked at how this works now what we're going to do is we're going to start by talking about the right can extension. There are two kinds of there are two kinds of can extensions: right can extensions and left can extensions. And to introduce this idea, we're going to suppose that a to the power of k has a right adjoint, and we're going to call that ran subscript k. So. Um, if what I'm saying starts to get too abstract, I suggest you consider the following kinds of um, substitutions, okay? Um, think of M as this category that makes graphs, think of A as set, think of C as this terminal object, and then you th can think of K as exclamation mark M. And in this case, uh, A to the power of K will basically look like the diagonal functor and what we're really doing is this problem of working out the right adjoint of the diagonal functor which we or which we already calculated was um, this functor pi which sends a graph to its set of points okay so if you look at things this way you won't get so confused because there's um there's a lot of different things going on uh, with can extensions. And I think one thing that makes them hard to understand is the kind of um, high dimensionality of everything, that the sheer sort of number of different sorts of transformations and spaces which are involved. And so if you consider a kind of simplified example um, as what's going on, then, you know, A, all the algebra will look simpler, and B, you'll have the ability to sort of drill down, right down to the bottom and understand how it's all working. So that should make it easier. Anyway, I'll 
talk about the thing in full generality now. So we're um, interested in this right adjoint. Um, so, so we're interested in this calculating this right adjoint, ran k. Now, such a um, adjoint functor may not exist in general. In the case where, for example, a is set and m and c is small, then we will have a right adjoint and a left adjoint. In fact, the left adjoint of a to the power of k relates to something called the left can extension in a way which is pretty much dual to what I'm about to discuss. But let me start by discussing the right can extension. So temporarily, let's suppose that we have this functor ran k, which is the right adjoint of a to the power of k. So we'll make our usual sort of picture um, about the kind of universal properties related to this situation. So suppose we have this object t. So now if we do ran k, on t, that's going to give us an object of a to the power of c, and we could call that r, okay? So r is in fact a functor from c to a, just like t is a functor from m to a. Now, here's the thing. Actually, I'll write that in red. I think color coding can be a very useful kind of uh, tool when things get complicated. So do you remember the property that um, we have as far as how this right adjoint relates to the co-unit? The thing is that um, we're going to have that there's going to be this arrow from a to the power of k of ran k of t, or we could say a to the power of k of r, to t. And that's going to be the teeth component of this co-unit here. So there's many ways we could write this thing here. We could write it as a to the power of k of ran k of t. And that's a kind of nice way to write it because it matches how we think of, um, how we think of like adjoint functors or we could in fact just evaluate this because we know how a to the power of k works. It results in giving us r after k. But here's the point. This is the really critical point for understanding what can extensions are. The point is that r, comma, epsilon t is a terminal morphism from a to the power of k to t. And if you'll permit me, um, I'll just do some relabeling. I want to call this thing epsilon dash instead. So I'd rather say r comma epsilon dash is a terminal morphism from a to the power of k to t. So why is this important? Well, the reason is because this is exactly what our right can extension is. So we have a name for this thing. We call it the right can extension of T along K. So basically, um, the can extension is actually, in a way, it's kind of simpler than um, an adjunction. It's it's really just a terminal morphism. It's really just one of these universal morphisms, which is related to a to the power of k. Okay, so um, when we have um, a right adjoint to a to the power of k, when we have this ran k thing here, we can easily produce uh, a can extension like this. We just, um, we want to do a can extension of t along k. So we just do ran k on t, that gives us r, and then we get the teeth component of the co-unit, and that gives us our epsilon dash, 
and oh look, we have a terminal morphism from A to the power of K to T. And there's our right can extension of T along K. But um, the thing is that we can also do this more generally, okay? So if there was a situation, for example, maybe we can't um, find a terminal morphism from A to the power of K to every object T in A to the power of M, just like in some categories, we can't find the product of every pair of objects, but maybe we can do it sometimes. Okay, so we can um, think about a more general kind of situation where um, we don't necessarily have this functor rank K that's like the right adjoint of A to the power of K. However, if we can find an object R in our category A to the power of C, together with this arrow epsilon from A to the power of K of R to T, which is forming a terminal morphism from A to the power of K to T, then that can be considered and is in fact exactly a right can extension of T along K. This is the definition. So it's really just a terminal morphism from A to the power. So it's really just a terminal morphism from A to the power of K to T. So let's just recall the definition of a terminal morphism then. Basically, the way this works is that if we have an object W in A to the power of C, together with an arrow from A to the power of K of W to T, let's say an arrow V, then there's going to exist this unique arrow, which we could call V bar from W to R, which has the property that A to the power of K of V bar followed by epsilon dash equals V, okay? Um, so basically this is what a can, this is what a right can extension is. Um, why is it called a can extension? Okay, this is also kind of interesting. So let's look at our original thing that we started with, which was an arrow K from M to C. Now, what if we consider the case where this arrow M is a monomorphism? Okay, um, so in this situation, um, we can really think of M as a subcategory of C. Okay, so we have our big category C. I'm just going to draw it a bit sort of pictorially. And then we have this kind of subcategory M, which we can think of as like inside C. And so that's kind of what K does. It gives us this kind of embedding. And the other thing that we deal with in our can extension is this T here which is basically a functor from M to A. So we also, in our picture, it's a bit cartoonish, but we also have this functor T from M to some other category A. And what we do with this T, which is sort of sending this stuff in M to A, is we sort of extend um, the sort of domain of this functor and that's why it's called a can extension, okay? Because we convert this functor T from M to A to this functor over here from C to A, okay? Because we're going from this T here and then we're getting this R over here. So what we're really doing is we're then making a sort of bigger functor, which goes from all of C to A. And this, um, well, it turns out that there's two sort of, at least in most, at least in a lot of situations, it turns out that there's two sort of special ways to do this kind of extension. There are two ways to sort of extend the domain of this functor from just working on this subcategory M to working over the whole category C. And these are corresponding to the left 
and the right can extensions of t along k. Now this situation I've just discussed is like we can think of it more clearly in the case where k is a monomorphism where k is like a kind of inclusion functor and when we're really thinking of m as like a subcategory. But if we sort of stretch our minds a bit we can think about a similar situation where k is just a sort of general functor and that's kind of where this terminology of can extensions comes from. Um, now I must say actually um, I don't consider myself at all an expert in can extensions um, and but I'll also say that I don't think that this um, like I think it's nice to have some intuition about where the sort of um, naming conventions come from and that's why you know these things are called can extensions but personally I much prefer you know the sort of concrete way of looking at a can extension um, which is just this okay it is literally just a terminal morphism from well a right can extension is a terminal morphism from a to the power of k to t so like I say uh, if you do have a right adjoint to a to the power of k then you can find the can extension of t so like I say if you do have the right adjoint of a to the power of k then you can use it to find the kind of right can extension of any t along k you can do that just by setting r comma epsilon dash equal to ran k of t comma co units of t um, and you can also go the other way around as well if you can find a right can extension of any t in a to the power of m along k then you've basically found all of these different sorts of terminal morphisms and you can use those to build the right adjoint of a to the power of k just as we kind of discussed before um, so you know the right adjoint saying there's a right adjoint is like saying that you can do one of these right can extensions um, of any t okay so i've talked about what right can extensions are um, now i might as well talk about what left can extensions are because it's really just the same kind of idea but just sort of dualized so so once again we have exactly the same situation where we have a functor k from m to c and we have an object t in this category a to the power of m or if you like t is a functor from m to a so the left can extension of this t along k is an initial morphism from t to a to the power of k so compare that with the other definition the right can extension of t along k is a terminal morphism from a to the power of k to t and the left can extension of t along k is an initial morphism from t to a to the power of k and once again we can think of this in terms of adjoint functors if we like so here's our situation here's a to the power of k now let's suppose it has a left adjoint temporarily which we'll call lan of k so lan of k is a left adjoint ran of k is a right adjoint so we're talking about lan of k now and here's our picture okay so we have our t in a to the power of m if we do lan of k on that lan k of t well let's give that a name we'll call it l and then we're going to have this um we're going to have this unit component that goes from t to a to the power of k of lan k of t and basically um, our left can extension of t along k um, we can just write it if we like as so i'll also call this e to dash so i'm following the same convention so we could say that l 
comma e to dash, which in this case is uh, 1k t comma eta of t is a left can extension of t along k. So that's our kind of situation. Um, but I mean, this is sort of more, uh, this what I've written here is like more, um, this is general, okay? Like this just happens when we have this sort of left adjoint lan k of a to the power of k, but we might still have can extensions even if there's no left adjoint existing. Um, so more generally, this is the proper definition. A left can extension of t along k is just an initial morphism from t to a to the power of k. So once again, the more general kind of situation is simply where we have an initial morphism. So we don't necessarily have to have this lan k functor, but we have an L and we have this uh, And we have this sort of initial morphism. So L comma E to dash is forming this initial morphism from T to the power, from T to A to the power of K. And this is exactly our left can extension of T along K. And this initial morphism, this can extension is of course defined by the feature that for any object W together with an arrow from T to A of W, maybe we could call it V, there exists this unique arrow from L to W, which we can call V bar, which has the property that A to the power of K of V bar after E to dash is V. So that's what a left can extension of T along K is. Okay, in this situation with left can extensions and left adjoints is pretty much the same as the case with right stuff. Okay, so um, if there's a left can extension of every T along K, then we're gonna have a left adjoint. And conversely, if we have a left adjoint, then we can find a left can extension of any T along K. So there we are. We know what left and right can extensions are. Now there's a, uh, two kind of questions, I suppose, now. Um, one is, uh, why do we care? And the other one is, well, how do we find these can extensions? Why do we care? Well, we've already seen that the left and the right adjoints of these kind of functors like a to the power of k are interesting. So that's a good reason to care. Um, it tells us lots of things about categories of presheaves. And there are other reasons as well why can extensions in particular are interesting things. Um, in particular, there's ways of representing all sorts of other things that happen in category theory, like our joint functors, for example, in terms of can extensions. So they're very powerful. Um, the second thing is how to compute them. And that's a great question. And so we're gonna look at that now. Um, so, Let's start with the right can extension. Now, this is the kind of um, big, this is the difficult bit, okay? <laughs> um, what's it, uh, Bartos said in one of his videos, uh, everything up to this point was easy, so now it's the difficult bit. Now, I, I realize that we've been um, pretty high on the level of, on the kind of abstractometer, so far, but now we really get. So, okay, what's coming up is the difficult bit, okay? Um, it's not terribly difficult as long as we follow it step by step and we're clear what we're doing, and I'll try and be clear. But, um, you know, this is the part where we talk about how to construct can extensions, and there's quite a few different things happening, um, and things get a bit abstract. But, um, Stick with it because we're going to do some examples 
and kind of uh, bring things down to earth. And hopefully it should be clear what's going on. Okay then, so we want to compute right can extensions. So we've pretty much encountered all the tools that we're going to need to use to do this, except for one thing. We want to have certain kinds of so-called comma categories. So let's pick an object C of our category bold C. Um, so that could be any object of this category bold C. And we're going to use it to form one of these comma categories. Now I'll just tell you about this specific category. So we call it C downwards arrow K. And as objects, it has pairs of an object M of our category bold M together with an arrow F from C to K of M. Okay, so that's what an object in this comma category looks like. And if this seems a bit too abstract, um, you know, that's okay, but do make sure that you understand this definition. Okay, so the objects of this comma category are essentially um, arrows from C to K of some M, where we record what that M is as well. And remember, K is our functor from this category bold M to this category C. So that's what an object of this comma category is. What about the arrows? Well, here's one object in our comma category, M comma F. And here's another object in our comma category, M dash comma F dash. And an arrow between them, an arrow U from this first object to this second one, what that would be would be an arrow U from M to M dash, which has the property that it makes this triangle commute. Okay, so we have K of U after F is equal to F dash. So those are what the arrows are. And you can check that if you compose such arrows, um, you can just basically compose the U's uh, in the category M, and that leads to a decent notion of arrow composition in this um, comma category. So we're going to be using these comma categories a bit. Um, so do make sure that you understand the definition of these things. Maybe pick some example and calculate. Um, and then the other thing we're going to be using is that there's a projection. There's a fairly sort of obvious projection from a comma category like this to the category M. And so here it is, we're calling this projection functor Q. And all it does is it'll send an object like this of our comma category to the M, it's kind of first entry. And also it just sends this U, which we're thinking of as a arrow from this object in the comma category to this one. It just changes that to just become this arrow U in our category M. So that's all we have then. So now that we have all these tools, we can actually start to compute um, our right can extension. So let's set this up properly. Um, again, I'll remind you, we have this uh, functor K from M to C, and we have then the A to the power of K is a functor from A to the power of C to A to the power of M. And now what we do, we're going to take an object T in a to the power of M, or if you like, we're going to take a functor T from M to A. And so what we're interested in computing is this right can extension, R comma epsilon dash of T along K. So here R is basically going to be a functor from C to A. And we're also going to have this kind of arrow from a to the power of k of r to t. Um, and basically, together, these two things are going to form a terminal morphism from a to the power of k of, to t. 
And that's what we're after. That's this right can extension of t along k, which we're going to compute. Now we are going to make certain assumptions in order to be able to finish this kind of construction. So in particular, um, we're going to assume that A is complete in the sense that any functor into A from a small category has a limit. And also, we're going to suppose that C and M are small. Okay, so this these conditions are met, for example, when A is set and C and M are small, as is the case for these kind of categories of structured sets that we've been dealing with so far. So with that said, let's go ahead and do this construction. What we really want to do for a start is we want to compute this. So what we really want to do for a start is we want to get this R. Now R is going to be a functor from C to A. And so our first task is to understand how this functor R works on objects. So we're going to let C be an object of our category bold C, okay? And what we're really interested in is computing R of C. And that's of course going to be an object of A. Okay, so here we go. We've got our object C of our category bold C, and we're interested in determining R of C. So how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to start by forming this comma category, C downwards arrow K, which I've already discussed. And we've noted already that there's a projection functor Q from that to this category M. Now, what we really want is a functor into A because, well, you'll see momentarily. So how can we make this into a functor into A? Well, look at T. T is a functor from M to A. So we can compose that on the end. And now we have a functor into A. That functor is T after Q. Why do we want that? Well, the thing is, what we really want is an object of A. So if we have a functor into A, how can we get an object of A? Well, what about if we take the apex of the limit cone of T after Q? And that's exactly what we do. That's what R of C is. So I'm probably going a bit too fast. Let me draw a picture to illustrate what I mean. This is a bit of a cartoon. It's unlikely that the comma category will look like this, but it should illustrate what's going on. So let's just imagine this is what our comma category C downwards arrow K looks like. Now um, we have this category A over here. I'll just draw it a bit bigger. It's one of the hardest things about category theory is drawing the categories big enough. Um, okay, so the um, functor TQ is going to send this thing here to this diagram in A. So that's TQ. And the thing is then, if we can find a limit cone of TQ, so that's going to have some apex like this, and there it's going to go. Well, if this is the apex of the limit cone, this is going to be an object of this category A. And this is actually what we're going to define to be R of C. Okay, so if we're being a bit more precise about this, we could say, well, okay, what we've got going on here, we've got this functor. I'm going to write the subscript downstairs now. So this is the constant functor that sends everything in our comma category to R of C. And we've also got this natural transformation phi from that to 
TQ. And so if we have an object, and so if we have an object M comma F in this comma category, then here is going to be T of Q of M comma F. And here is going to be phi of m comma f, and so on. And here we're imagining that this phi here is really giving us the limit cone of T Q, and that's great because this limit cone is going to have an apex, and that apex is going to be an object of A, and that's what we want. In fact, that's what we're going to define R of C as. Okay. So this is our next thing. We're going to let R of C be the apex of the limit cone. Of T after Q. And the thing is, though, that this is going to work because we've essentially assumed that any functor from a small category into A is going to have a limit. So in particular, this functor TQ coming from this comma category is going to have a limit. And so we can do this kind of operation for every object C of our category C. We can use each of those objects in turn to form a comma category and then make this kind of um, TQ thing and then we can and then we can find the apex of the limit cone of that and in that way we can define how this functor R which we're sort of building works on all the objects of C so I mean the other thing of course and the thing that's actually a bit more complicated is how this functor R works on arrows. OK, now at this point, um, I think it's a really great idea. Um, I suggested earlier there's a particular example you can have in mind, which we've already explored. So I think this is a good point to actually see if you can follow through this logic and um, do the computation so far and see if you can work out how R works for that particular example, at least on objects. But I'm not going to divert my attention now. I want to finish describing this can extension. So let's carry on. Um, so the next thing is, we're going to suppose now that we have an arrow in this category C. So we're going to suppose in particular that we have this arrow g from c to c dash and this is an arrow in our category c and what we're after is we want to calculate this arrow r of g and this is of course going to be an arrow from r of c to r of c dash so in order to set all this up properly so it doesn't get too confusing i want to be very clear about the notation i'm using okay um, because the trouble is that we've sort of got different comma categories and different functors coming out of them. So I'm going to focus on this particular arrow from C to C dash, and I want to talk about the different things involved. So this is the notation I'm going to be using. Let's suppose we have an object A in our category bold A, okay? So we're going to write so we're going to write delta subscript A to denote the constant functor from this comma category to this category bold A 
And this functor just sends everything in this comma category here to this object A in this category A. Okay, so that's as we've already been doing. But we're also now going to be considering a different comma category, which is this comma category C dash downwards arrow K. So this is a different comma category because it's formed using a different object. OK, it's going to look different. And now when I write delta dash subscript A, this is a constant functor which sends everything to this object A, but this time it's coming from this comma category here. Now I've also, I'll use a different color so it doesn't get too confusing. I've also described a projection functor Q which comes from this comma category here to M. Now there's another sort of projection function, which I shall call Q dash. And that comes from this comma category here to M, but it basically works in the same sort of way. It just grabs the M's and the arrows. Um, and it's just this sort of projection functor. So all that being said, the other thing is basically what I've illustrated up here. So let me just draw this out again. So this limit cone that we've already had, well, I'll just... So the other thing is about this limit cone. So let me just draw this out again. This is basically this picture up here. So this phi, which is a natural transformation like this. This is the limit cone of TQ, okay? So R of C is the apex of this limit cone and the sort of sides of the limit cone are given by this natural transformation phi. Now, the other sort of limit cone that we're gonna be thinking about is gonna be this one involving this comma category. So it's using this comma category C dash downwards arrow K. So this other situation, well, the apex of this limit cone is going to be R of C dash. So this is going to be the functor that sends everything in this comma category C dash downwards arrow K to R of C dash. And then the other functor involved is going to be T after Q dash. And these are again, both functors into A but now the kind of sides of this limit cone are given by a natural transformation, which we'll call phi dash. So this here, this is phi dash. Okay, so be careful here because it's easy to get confused. Um, phi here is our limit basically of TQ. Um, and phi dash is our limit of t after q dash. Now I actually made a little mistake here. I should have put a little dash there because we can think of phi dash as coming from this functor here, which actually has a source as c dash downwards arrow k. So this functor is delta dash r of c dash. Anyway, here's the... Um, Here's the sort of fancy bit. We're going to define another natural transformation. And here it is, we're gonna call it mu, okay? Now, it's sort of similar in its source and target to phi dash, okay? It's a functor, it's a natural transformation between two functors that come from this comma category C dash downwards arrow K. But the difference is that the apex of mu is different okay because the apex of mu is actually the same as the apex of our original limit cone phi and so the question is how do we define mu well let's see for a start if we can visualize what's going on a little bit So again, I'm just going to draw a sort of cartoonish picture of what's going on. So 
So this time, what we'll draw over here is actually this comma category C dash, downwards arrow K. And TQ dash is going to make that into a sort of diagram in our category A. And then the other thing we have and then the other thing we have is this sort of limit cone okay so it's got these sort of arrows so these are going to be given by things like um, phi dash m comma f dash where this would be m comma f dash over here, an object of this comma category. And then of course, we're gonna have R of C dash. And that's going to be the apex of um, this limit cone. But now we're also going to make another cone, okay? Um, I'll draw it in purple. So now the apex of this new cone, which probably isn't gonna be a limit cone, but the apex of it, um, is actually going to be R of C, okay? So it's it's actually going to have the apex that the limit cone of TQ had. But remember, we're not talking about TQ at the moment, we're talking about TQ dash, okay? This is the functor which makes this diagram that I've drawn so far. So this here, for example, this would be, whoops, I mean TQ dash. So this would be TQ dash of m comma f dash up here, for example. Anyway, um, so we have this other kind of limit cone that we're going to make. And our strategy, just so you can see it coming, is that this means there's going to be this unique intermediary arrow, um, which is going to allow us to emulate what's happening with this candidate cone. And that's going to be what we define as R of G. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because we haven't actually defined. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because we haven't actually defined how this uh, natural transformation mu actually works. So, for example, this higher purple arrow here, this is going to be mu of M comma F dash. So the real question then is how do we cook up this natural transformation mu? Okay, how do we get that? Well, let's ask ourselves another question, which is what does this object look like? In particular, what's this F dash look like? Well, we know it's an object of our comma category. So we know that it's going to be an arrow from C dash to K of M. Okay, because that's what the objects in this comma category look like. Um, so do we have a way to sort of convert the form of this? Well, yes, we do. We, we have this arrow G look, this arrow from C to C dash. So what would happen if we composed G like this? So now we have this arrow F dash after G, and that's an arrow from C to K of M. And look, we also have this. Okay, so let's now consider what is phi of M comma F dash of g does that make sense okay so what's phi so let's just lift this up here and we'll think about what it means so because what i'm proposing is that we use this to define our mu in particular we're going to define mu of m comma f dash to equal this okay so is this going to give us something of the right kind of form so 
So really, what if we're going to understand whether this makes sense, we need to understand how phi works. OK, so what's a component of phi look like? Well, we know it's going to be an arrow. So let's consider, for example, the component m comma f. What does that look like? Well, the source of that arrow is going to be the apex of our limit cone. So it's going to be R of C. And the target of the arrow would be T of Q of M comma F. And we know that that's just going to be T of M. OK, because we know how our projection functor Q works. And what's F here? Well, F is just going to be an arrow from C to K of M, right? So why not then, instead of just using this F here, why don't we instead use F dash after G, right? We know that that's also an arrow from C to K of M. And so if we change this here to be an F dash after G, then that kind of thing also has the right kind of signature. And so it's looking like this kind of um, this kind of definition is going to make sense. And indeed it does. So now we get to our next proper step then. We're going to define this natural transformation mu so that so that we've got this equation holding for every object m comma f dash in our comma category c dash downwards arrow k so okay fine now what well now the rest of the constructions more straightforward OK, because we can basically use this kind of idea. We've um, we know we have um, this limit cone of T after Q dash. So we know that phi dash is this limit cone of T Q dash. And we also have this cone mu of T Q dash. And therefore, um, by the properties of limits, there's going to be this unique arrow, which we're going to define as R of G, um, which commutes with these sides of the cones. So, so here's the argument then. We've cooked up this kind of candidate cone mu for TQ dash. We also have this limit cone phi dash for TQ dash, and therefore there's going to exist this unique arrow, and that's what we're defining as R of G, and it's this unique arrow which has this property that it commutes with the sides of the cone. So in particular, we're going to have that phi dash of M comma F dash after R of G equals mu of M comma F dash for every object M comma F dash of our comma category C dash downwards arrow K. And uh, that's it. That's what we wanted. OK, so we're pretty much done with um, describing this can extension. Um, we've described how to find this functor R, and that's really the main bit. We've described how to find this functor R, and that's really the main bit. So we know that we can find how R works on objects. It basically sends them to apexes of limits of particular functors into A. And then we've found that we can cook up this kind of mu and um, find this kind of unique arrow uh, between apexes of cones. And that gives us how R works on arrows. Um, the only other thing to do is to work out this epsilon dash. OK, um, now this is going to be an arrow from A to the power of K of R to T. And we know that this is also just going to be R after K. 
So we're looking for an arrow from R after K to T. That makes sense because T is an arrow from M to A. And also if we um, start at M and then we go along K, then we're going to be in C. And then if we go along R, we'll also be in A. So the sort of um, these kind of things have the right kind of type. So, okay, the question really is, how do we find epsilon dash? And we know it's a natural transformation, so we're going to work out what its components are. So here's how we do it. Let's just start by picking an object N of this category M, any object. And now we know that K of N is going to be an object of C. And so we can consider this comma category here, k of n downwards arrow k. So this is pretty much the same kind of thing as before. It's just now, it's just now this thing here is going to be our c, but we're going to call it k of m. So what we want to do now is we want to find an object in this comma category. And here's an object, it's n comma identity arrow of k of n. So you can check that this is indeed an object in this category. And now all we do is we look at the kind of limit cone, which is defined by the kind of arrows coming out of this thing, like before. Okay, so uh, let's call, so we know that this, uh, there's going to be this functor t q dash dash which is going to go from this comma category to a so here q dash dash is just the projection functor from this comma category to m and if we do that and then we do t we get this functor here that goes into a and then we can find a limit cone of that so r of k n is going to be the apex of it and the actual limit cone is really given by this natural transformation that i'm calling phi dash dash and now here's the thing we know that this thing here is an object of this category here right so we can consider what's the component of phi dash dash corresponding to this object so um that would be phi dash dash of n comma identity k n so what kind of arrow is that well we know that it's going to go from R of KN to T of Q dash dash of N comma identity KN. And that's just T N, right? So that's what that's going to be the source and target of this arrow, phi dash dash n identity k n. And look, that's exactly um, the same kind of uh, source and target as epsilon dash subscript n is going to have. And it turns out indeed that if we define the nth component of epsilon dash to be equal to phi double dash of n comma identity of k n, then we're done. That defines epsilon dash and that completes the job. So now we've actually found the right can extension um, of T along K. And I think we can pat ourselves on the back, to be honest, because this is like, um, you know, if you followed this all the way through, then like, as far as I look at things, like this is about, you can use these can extensions to understand like the rest of category theory. And yeah, it's, um, it's quite remarkable. So now we've gone through this construction of, so now we've found how to construct right can extensions. Now in the case where A is set, of course you can construct these kind of limits explicitly and deal with the limit cones explicitly. And this gives you a kind of way of finding 
the kind of right adjoints to all of these interesting kind of functors that convert between categories of structured sets and so on. Okay, so what we want to do is an example of a calculation of one of these right can extensions. So let's look at a fairly simple, although extremely interesting case. So we're going to have A as set, and that's great because sets complete. And so the kind of functors from small categories into sets are going to have limits. And that means we can carry out these steps involved in this kind of construction of a right can extension. So this is the kind of functor K that we're going to be interested in. So we're going to have M is equal to our terminal object in our category of categories, this single object, single arrow category. And we'll have C as this additive monoid of natural numbers, this category that generates our category of dynamical systems. And so of course, set to the power of K is going to be this functor from set to the power of C to set to the power of one. And set to the power of one is basically just gonna be isomorphic to set itself. And what this functor does set to the power of K is pretty simple. It just sends a dynamical system to its set of underlying states. So let's say we're interested in, for example, calculating the right adjoint of this functor. So that's a very interesting thing. It sends a set to a dynamical system in a very special way. And we can get at that uh, by using can extensions. So the kind of problem we, we really want to solve is that for some uh, t in set to the power of m, which in our case is set to the power of one. So really, in this case, we can think of t as a set. Um, so for some set t, we want to think about what the right can extension of t along k is, okay? And that's going to be a pair of a functor r from c to set, in other words, a dynamical system r, and this arrow epsilon dash. And together, these are forming a terminal morphism from set to the power of k to t. So this is the problem we're interested in. And we're just going to basically follow the steps um, that we've already described. So um, just to make this very concrete, um, really, m is this terminal object. And so t is a member of set to the power of one. And so we can think of t as a functor um, from the terminal object to set. But if you think about what a functor like that is, it's basically just going to be um, picking out a particular object in this category set, okay? Because um, this is an arrow in cat from a terminal object and such arrows pick out a, an object of their target category essentially just like, well, yeah. Um, so basically we can think of T as a set and to make this concrete, let's suppose that T is this set just containing zero and one. So, okay, um, what about our category C? Well, it just has one object star. So our category C is this uh, free monoid with one generator here. Um, so it has this arrow sigma, it also has sigma after sigma, which we call sigma squared, and it has sigma cubed and all of those sigmas. And we'll sometimes refer to the identity arrow as sigma to the power of zero. So all we do now is just follow our procedure for constructing the right can extension. So remember, it starts by trying to figure out how this functor R works on objects. So we want to pick an object of the category C. Well, there's only one, that's star. So star is the only object of category C. And we want to work out what is R of star. And if you remember, the way we do that is we form this functor, which goes from this comma category. So we've got to think about what this comma category is. And then we're going to have this projection to um, M, well, in our case, M is the terminal object. So that projection is just going to be this kind of unique arrow into the terminal object. And then after that, we do this functor T, which then goes into our category set 
And then what we want to do is we want to determine a limit of that functor. So really the thing we want to think about mostly is what does this comma category look like? And um, if you think about it a bit, um, you'll realize that basically um, this is um, basically going to be corresponding to the sort of discrete category uh, formed on the set of arrows from star to star in the category C. Because if you think about it, what are the objects of this uh, category? Well, such an object is going to be an object of M. Well, there's only one object in M, which is star, together with an arrow from star to K of M which is again star. And this thing over here is basically just um, an arrow of this category C. So basically this F is just going to be sigma to the power of N for some number N greater than or equal to zero. So they're what the objects of this category look like. So we can think of the objects of this category star downwards arrow k as sigma to the power of n, where n is greater than or equal to zero. And if you think about what the arrows of this category are, and so if this is one arrow of our category, and then we also have another arrow, let's say this one here, and say we have an arrow u between them. Well, u is going to have to basically correspond in m. It's going to have to correspond with this arrow, um, which is actually only the identity arrow. That's the only possibility. Um, and that's going to be the sort of corresponding arrow in m equals this terminal object because that's actually the only possibility. But in order for this U to be an arrow in the comma category, we're also going to have to have that, um, we're also going to have to have that this triangle commutes And since this is going to be um, basically just an identity arrow of star, um, that's going to imply that M is equal to M. OK, so basically um, the conclusion is that this category, it just has objects corresponding to like sigma, the objects of this category, we can think of them as sigma to the power of zero, sigma to the power of one, sigma to the power of two, and so on um, forever. But also the only other arrows, the only, but also the only arrows of this category are basically just identity arrows. So um, a succinct way to describe this category or something isomorphic to it, if you like, is um, the discretization of Hom C star comma star. In other words, if you look at the set of arrows in C from star to star, and then you use that set to form a discrete category, um, so you just use that as your set of objects and you only have identity arrows, that's basically how we can think of this comma category. Um, so then the next thing is this projection functor. And like I say, this is basically just collapsing all of this kind of infinite list of um, simple objects down to the single object of the terminal object of cat. So this functor basically just collapses all this information down here like this. And so the real question is, um, after we collapse everything down, we then do this functor T. So that's going to pick out this set uh, here. And we're really interested in what's going to be the limit of this kind of functor. Um, because if you remember that basically we're interested in this um, object star of the category C 
and we're trying to calculate r of star. And recall that r of star should be the apex of the limit cone of this functor t after q. So this is our next problem. Um, what's the limit cone of this kind of functor? And so if you just draw this functor out, basically what it's doing is it has this kind of index category, which is just like a load of isolate, whoops, is that it has this kind of index category that's just like a load of isolated objects. And it's just sending each of those objects to this set T. And so really what this functor is doing is it's just, um, the diagram of it is just like a load of isolated copies of T. And so the limit of this is basically just going to be uh, the kind of categorical, or actually in this case, Cartesian product of an infinite number of copies of T. So in other words, the answer here, the limit of this functor T after Q is just T times T times T times T times T uh, dot 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 forever. Um, and so we can quite succinctly write that as to just say that, well, um, the apex of this limit cone, we could write it as t to the power of infinity. Um, so it's basically the set of infinite lists of elements from this set, capital T. Um, and that's what R star is, okay? So in our example where t is just this set holding zero and one, um, basically R of star um, is just this, set of infinite binary strings okay which is pretty interesting so basically r i mean what's the nature of r it's a functor from uh, c to set okay um and so it's basically a dynamical system and here we see that the set of states of the dynamical system is basically the set of infinite sequences of elements um that we can make from t so if this is a dynamical system then what, how does this updating work? And that's extremely interesting, actually. So the answer, I'll tell you the answer first, and then we'll go through how we actually get at this. Um, the answer is that if we update a binary string, we essentially are just gonna be shifting um, that binary string one step to the left, okay? So if we just knock off the leftmost character and shift everything else across one step to the left, that gives our kind of updated system. So this is really quite fascinating because systems like this are used quite a lot in things like symbolic studies of dynamical systems. And you can see all kinds of interesting chaotic dynamics and also connections with number theory if you think about these kind of things as digit sequences and different bases and things. Um, so for example, you can have two cycles in this dynamical system R in our case. Um, so if you consider this sort of infinitely alternating binary string, actually I've got it down here. Yeah, if you consider this kind of infinitely alternating di binary string, shifting it to the left twice returns itself. So it's part of a two cycle. But of course, most of these binary strings, um, they won't be periodic. And so um, they'll just sort of evolve forever without going into cycles. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is fascinating, but it's, and, you know, if you're interested in, for example, calculating adjoint functors, this is probably enough information to guess how the rest of the system works. And then you can prove that um, you've got adjoint functors. But the really beautiful thing that you can do, like with this method of can extensions, is you can actually sort of explicitly calculate how all this stuff works and sort of see how it comes about. So let's do that now. So, I mean, really, um, this t to the power of infinity, it's an it's a product, okay? It's a it's a limit actually of this functor t q, and so um, like well, actually, this is the apex of a limit cone. But what's the actual limit? Well, let's call it phi, okay? So it has this kind of form. Um, it's like a natural transformation from the Fun from the constant functor to the apex of the limit cone to tq. And how does it work? Well, basically it's just projections, okay? Um, so let's be a bit more explicit about it. Um, 
we want this is a natural transformation so it's going to have components indexed by objects of the kind of source category of these functors and those objects are basically like sigma to the power of n so let's pick an n greater than or equal to zero and then we're going we're interested in the nature of this kind of sigma nth component of this limit cone phi and so that's going to go from this to this and we can work it out that basically it's an arrow from t to the power of infinity to t and in fact the way it works something in t to the power of infinity that's going to be like an infinite sequence of values from the set t and then this phi to the phi sigma n is just going to be a projection function which takes the sort of nth entry from this list so it maps this to this t subscript n which is an element of the set t so okay that's how our limit cone works now can we actually calculate how r of sigma works well yes we can um so consider um so basically the way this works if you remember um the, the sort of method we wanted to have an arrow like this g from c to c dash and then we try and calculate r of g well in this case here there's only really one well the main one we're interested in is sigma okay and in our case c and c dash are both going to be equal to star because that's the only object of category c so we're really interested in r of sigma okay we're basically interested in how the update function works for the dynamical system r so let's try and figure this out um so here's our arrow and then we can like we defined mu before we're basically going to define it similarly again here so basically uh, mu is going to be a natural transformation like in the um more general case i discussed before it was a bit more complicated because it could be that the sort of comma categories that we're playing with are different for different sort of objects like c and c dash but in this case it's a bit simpler because there's only one object in our category c and so mu is just going to be a natural transformation um, from delta of r star to t q and the nth component of mu um, we see from our previous formula in this case it's just going to be phi of sigma n after n which is phi of sigma n plus one so basically this natural transformation mu which we're going to use to calculate r of sigma it's going to send this infinite sequence here of values of t to the nth plus one value in that sequence so now if you remember the way we use mu to find r of sigma is we basically say that r of sigma is then going to be this unique arrow such that this kind of equation holds um, for every n greater than or equal to zero and this is basically saying that this is the r of sigma is this kind of unique arrow between um, the apexes of cones which comes about because one of our cones is a limit cone um, you know this unique arrow which sort of commutes with the sides of the cone and so basically what's this equation say well it says that uh, phi of sigma n after r of sigma equals phi of sigma n plus one so if we just sort of um, take a infinite sequence t underlined and sort of do these functions on it um, then we get this kind of system okay so this is just obtained by taking this and plugging in a t on the right hand side um, and working it out we find that the nth component of r of sigma of t underlined is just t n plus one so basically that means that r of sigma is actually just this left shift operator just like, like we claimed so it operates on an infinite sequence like this and then it just shifts it one step to the left so i think it's just so interesting that we can see all this stuff come about so explicitly by using our kind of construction and remember that you can do this for so many different kinds of functors and remember that you can do this kind of operation for so many different kinds of functors in fact if you have any functor 
from one small category to another, then you can consider the sort of set to the power of k thing. And you can think about these kind of right can extensions and use them to construct the right adjoint of such a thing. And this teaches you a lot about the nature of um, all of these different um, categories of structured sets. Okay, so we've worked Okay, so we've worked out basically how this functor R works. So we've almost worked out what the right can extension of T along K is. The only other thing we have to do is work out the other part of that terminal morphism, the epsilon dash. But we have a way of doing that, or but we've seen a way of doing that already. We've seen that if we pick an object N in M, and then we look at the kind of limit cone of KN down, and then we look at the kind of limit cone of this functor coming from KN downwards arrow K, this limit cone phi double dash, then we can basically define epsilon dash of N to be phi double dash of N identity KN. So let's just apply this kind of technique um, to our situation with these dynamical systems. So everything gets a lot simpler there. Our category M is just um, the terminal object, so it only has one object. So our choice of N has to be star, the only object of the terminal object of cat. And um, in this case, this um, limit cone that we use for this kind of corresponding comma category is just gonna be this limit cone phi, which we've already been using. And um, then we basically just want to take, um, so if we look at the identity arrow, so if we look at um, K of N, that's just going to be the object of the category, uh, the additive monoid of natural numbers. And um, so then the identity arrow, that's just sigma zero. So basically in our case, uh, epsilon dash just has one component and that's just sigma zero. So basically what all this means if we look now again at the kind of form that epsilon dash is supposed to have, it's supposed to be a natural transformation from R after K uh, to T. And so it's starth component is supposed to go from R of K of star to T. And basically the way we're sort of thinking of this, you know, applying this isomorphism from uh, set to the power of one to set, Basically, we can just think of epsilon dash as a kind of function from t to the power of infinity to t. And it basically just corresponds with phi subscript zero. So in a nutshell, basically epsilon dash just operates on an infinite sequence of symbols from t and it just picks the leftmost symbol. And it seems like a very kind of natural idea. Um, and so now we have this right can extension we can actually like compute how these kind of adjoint functors work. So in particular, we've seen this kind of set to the power of K, which changes a dynamical system to its underlying kind of a set. And um, now we really want to find the right adjoint to that, which we're calling ran K. And so if we pick an object T, basically if we pick a set T, then we've already figured out how to find this kind of corresponding um, functor R, this dynamical system R, this kind of left shift infinite sequence dynamical system um, from our can extension thing. And uh, basically we can think of ran K as operating on objects so that it sends this T to such an R. Um, but the other question is how does ran K operate on arrows? Okay, and to, to look at that, we can just look at our kind of previous view of um, how we can think of the right adjoint, okay? So we basically have a kind of situation like this. We have an arrow H from T to T squiggle. We can think of this as a function in the category set. And we're interested in like what's ran K of H. And so the point is that this is going to go from the kind of R corresponding with this T to that kind of R squiggle corresponding to this T squiggle. And it's going to be the unique arrow making this kind of diagram commute here 
uh, this epsilon dash is going to be the teeth component of the co-unit and this epsilon dash squiggle is going to be the uh, t-squiggle component of the co-unit involved in this adjunction. So the question is, what's the kind of unique arrow from this kind of uh, left shift dynamical system built out of T to this kind of left shift dynamical system built out of T squiggle, um, which makes this kind of square commute. Well, we know that there's only going to be one such arrow by the sort of um, properties of adjoint functors and whatnot. Um, but um, what is it? Well, one idea, we know we have this arrow H and we know we're supposed to transform um, a sequence like this of a val an infinite sequence of values from T to an infinite sequence of values from T squiggle. And we know we have this function H from T to T squiggle. So why don't we just apply it to each of these entries? And this gives a proper kind of arrow. And indeed, this does make this kind of square commute. So that basically finishes the job. We've actually calculated the right adjoint to this functor that we're interested in. So I think this is a bit of a lengthy calculation, but I mean, think about how many different things we're seeing on, but I mean, think about how many different ways of looking at things we're seeing with this kind of approach. Um, so there's various other kinds of calculations that I've done um, that I've sort of thought I shouldn't include uh, in this video because I don't want it to get like taking until the end of the universe to finish. Um, so I'm going to sort of upload some links to these rough documents and you can have a look. Um, but I, I really think, you know, it's so worthwhile to take an example. I mean, this example with dynamical systems is kind of a bit complicated because um, it's involving these kind of, it has infinite it has an infinite comma category that we're dealing with. But if you do a similar thing, like let's say you work out the right adjoint to the functor um, involved with graphs, um, that's a simpler calculation and that can also be illuminating. And, you know, I'll give the method for constructing left can extensions as well. So basically for every category of structured sets, you can find the left and right can extensions of, um, well, lots of functors involved with those. So you can learn so much about different kinds of categories of structured sets and spaces and all sorts uh, using these kind of can extensions. And that's not to mention that there's all sorts of other kinds of um, ideas in category theory, like for example, adjoint functors, which can be expressed in terms of can extensions. So can extensions are basically, or can be thought of as this kind of um, super, powerful concept from category theory that the other ideas can be expressed in terms of. Okay, so now we've seen how to do right can extensions. The next thing we want to understand is how to construct left can extensions. Now, this is not actually as difficult as it sounds. It's basically just the dualization of what we've done with the right can extensions. So here's basically how it works we have this object we have this object t of our functor category we have we have this object t of our functor category a to the power of m and we also have an arrow k from m to c and what we're after is this left can extension we want this uh, functor l from c to a together with this arrow e to dash that basically forms this initial morphism from t to a to the power of k so this is what we're after and once again we're going to start with comma categories but this time these comma categories are gonna be a bit different. So let's pick an object C of our category bold C, and we want to form this comma category K downwards arrow C. Now, this category has 
objects which we can think of as pairs of an object M of this category bold M together with an arrow F from K of M to C. And now an arrow from one object to another in our comma category, it's basically going to be corresponding with an arrow U from M to M dash such that this diagram commutes. Okay, so we're going to have F dash after K of U equals F. So that's the nature of this kind of comma category. And we're going to have one of those for every object of C. So the first thing we're going to try and do then is define this functor L, which goes from C to A. So again, we're going to define how it works on objects. And to do that, we want to use a projection functor. So there's going to be a projector. So there's going to be a projection functor P pretty similar to the Q we saw before. And it goes from the comma category to this category M. And basically the way it works is that it just sends an arrow U from this object of the comma category to this one. And it sends that to this arrow U from M to M dash. So it basically just throws away some information and just sort of projects down the information about how M's getting mapped around by these arrows in the comma category. And given this stuff, we can then understand the nature. Well, we can at least understand how this functor L works on objects. OK, so if we pick an object C, then we can consider this functor T after P. So P is going to go into M and then T is a functor from M to A. As we can see here. So T after P is going to be a functor into A. And for this proof, kind of similar to like before, we're going to assume that all functors into A from small categories have co-limits. And we're also going to assume that M and C are small categories. So that means that this functor here is going to have a co-limit. And we just define L of C and we just define L of C um, and we just define L of C to be the apex of the co-cone, which is the co-limit of this functor here. So T after P is a functor into A. And if it has a co-limit, then that co-limit co-cone is going to have an apex. And that's what we define L of C to be. So far, so good. We've defined how this functor L works on objects. And you can see that it's basically dual to what we discussed before. The other thing to do to finish defining L is to say how it works on arrows. So consider an arrow G from C to C dash. Well, what we're going to do is think about these different co-cones. So in particular, let's just make sure we're clear on the terminology. So if we have an object A of our category bold A, we're going to let delta A denote the constant functor, which sends everything in this comma category to this object of A. And we're also going to let P denote this projection functor. But when we're dealing with this other comma category, K downwards arrow C dash, which is now built using this other object C dash involved in this arrow we're interested in. Well, when we're using C dash, we use delta dash to denote the kind of diagonal functor and P dash to denote the kind of projection functor we have. And so we have these co-limit co-cones. We have phi, which is this co-limit co-cone of T after P and that has an apex L of C. And we also have phi dash, which is the co-limit co-cone of T after P dash. And that has an apex L of C dash. And in a similar way to before, we're going to cook up a new natural transformation, a new co-cone, and then we're going to use the kind of universal property of co-limits to define L of G. So here we go. 
um, we want to define this cocone mu. So this is going to be a cocone of T after P. And it's going to have an apex, which is L of C dash. Now, the way we, that we define this, the thing is that if we think about uh, phi dash, that's um, this cocone here. And the thing is with it, it's going to have components which are indexed by objects in this category. What are objects in this category? Well, they basically consist of an object M paired with an arrow from KM into C dash. So can we get something like that? Well, what about this? What about if we consider M comma G after F? Well, G after F here is an arrow from K of M to C dash. And so if we consider M comma G F, that's going to be an object in the comma category K downwards arrow C dash. And therefore we can speak of phi dash. And therefore we can speak of that kind of corresponding component of this natural transformation phi dash. And what kind of arrow is that going to be? Well, it's going to go from T of M to L of C dash. And so this has the right kind of signature. So what we do is that for every M comma F in K downwards arrow C, we define mu of M comma F like this. And this is what defines this cocone here. Now, this probably won't be a co-limit, but it will be a cocone. And if we compare it with phi, then we get the universal, then we get this kind of intermediary arrow we're after. So this is the kind of picture. We have this co-limit cocone of TP. So this is the kind of picture we're after. We have this co-limit cocone. So this is the kind of picture we're after. We have this co-limit cocone of TP. This is phi. And then we've just also cooked up this other kind of candidate cocone of TP, which is mu. And so what that means is that there's going to be this unique intermediary arrow, which we're going to define L of G to B, um, which basically commutes with the walls of these cocones. So in particular, there's going to be a unique arrow L of G just by the properties of co-limits, which um, is this unique arrow such that L of G after phi of M comma F equals mu comma F. So in particular, there's going to be this unique arrow L of G such that L of G after phi of M comma F equals mu comma F for each object M comma F of our comma category K downwards arrow C. And so this defines how our functor L works on arrows of the category C. And therefore we've finished defining how this functor L works. So with this, we've described how to basically calculate the functor involved in the can extension, okay? So we're interested in computing this left can extension and we've basically said how to find out L. So the only other thing is how to find out eta dash. And basically we can do that um, as described here, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Um, for an object N of this category M, um, we can just define, uh, well, notice that um, this is going to be um, one of our comma categories is K downwards arrow KN. And then if we consider uh, T after the projection from that, that's going to have a co-limit. Let's call it phi double dash. And um, basically, if we just take the component N comma identity KN, N comma identity KN of that co-limit cocone, we'll define that to be E to dash of N. And that defines this a natural transformation e to dash that we're after. So that completes it. That's how we find everything in this left can extension. 
in general. And again, if we can do this for every object T, then we're essentially finding all of the initial morphisms uh, from any kind of T to, from any of these kind of T to A to the power of K. And if you have a bunch of initial morphisms like that, you can use them um, with the kind of theory that we've been discussing to find this kind of left adjoint of A to the power of K. Or you can do similar with the right kind of extension. So basically, as I've already, I've already kind of discussed this, right? There's this way of looking at adjoint functors where if you can work out all these universal morphisms for all of the kind of objects and you have one of the functors, then you can get its adjoints, okay? So basically, now we kind of know how to find left and right adjoints of A to the power of K. And this is, of course, very cool because when we're considering sets, then, I mean, yeah, there's some um, limits of functors into sets or maybe some co-limits if we're dealing with left can extensions, but we know how to compute those, okay? So everything becomes really explicit and this becomes a really kind of explicit computational method. Um, so that's very good. So I wouldn't want this video to get too long. So I think I might end it there. Um, I have some extra notes that I'll put in the description. I'll put links to extra sort of videos in the description about how um, some relationship between can extensions and adjoint functors that I haven't mentioned in the main video. And I may also upload extra kind of examples of constructions with can extensions and documents um, detailing my kind of notes about this because I've, I've worked out lots of other cases that I'm not talking about here. Uh, but I think this is enough for one to get going with.